everybody. It's me, John Ward, and I am back with another One Filmmaker, One Film. And today my guest is... Daniel Perrins. And thank you, Daniel, for being here. This is this is awesome because I'm I'm a fan of your films. I did not know if you would say yes or no, and you said yes. So thank you for being here. Of course, I'm sort of half there, but sorry about my reception on the video end. It's just where I'm located right now is uh, kind of a weird spot. So I'm unfortunately I'm able to to do the face to face, but we'll we'll make that up next time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. So yeah. So to let people know, I'll be video. Daniel will be audio. And then, um, yeah, I guess you could check in and watch this video once it's up to see what I'm showing and stuff, because I already told Daniel in advance that I have a stack of movies here, and I'll be showing those off, even though he won't <laughs> be able to see them. <laughs> <laughs> so I I know you from Halloween 6 or 666 or Halloween Curse of Michael Myers. Um, and, pick your title. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And pick your version. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so I own both on Blu-ray. So I, I nice. have the theatrical and I have the, the producer's cut, and I'm going to show those for the, for the people out there. So I got, I got both of them here. And um, it's funny, is out of the Halloween movies, the theatrical cut was the first one I owned on Blu-ray. You would okay. think, yeah, it would be John Carpenter's Halloween that I would own first on Blu-ray, but it wasn't. It was it was this one. Well, I would I would think so, but I will <laughs> I take the compliment. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, sure. And um, yeah. so, how did you get that? Because from what I read, you were a fan. I I was a fan. I mean, such a an, a rabid fan that I actually made like my own Halloween and Friday the Thirteenth movies in junior high and high school. And we're talking about the early mid eighties at this point. So you know. Um, you know, I was like, these movies were directly targeted to my, you know, age range, even though they're rated R movies, you know, they were, you know, and as they are today, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of made for the 14 to 18 year old crowd. So, I mean, when all of those original films were coming out, the first parts of, you know, those series of franchises, now they're up to, you know, parts 12 and 13, but then it was the original and the first couple sequels. And, you know, that that just became kind of like a tipping point in my life creatively and everything else. So I just was kind of became that kid that, you know, was always making horror films. And and so, you know, I remember for my 10th, uh, dating myself here, but my 10th reunion for high school, um, nobody was surprised that I had done that movie. Like they were like, well, of course you did. There's, there's we, we had no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> so it's always that kid. So but no, I really was a fan and I and, and I didn't get the job because I was a fan. I got the job because I, I you know, I wrote something else that was a non-Halloween script that got to the, fortunately got to the desk of Mustafa Akkad, who, you know, um, rest in peace now, sadly. Yeah. Uh, but he saw something in me, you know, and he, and he opened the door for me that, you know, it's not easy um, to kind of get that first shot. And he was willing to take a gamble on me. And at the time, you know, remember I was like, when we did Halloween 6, I was 24. So I was six years younger than John Carpenter was when he made the first Halloween oh, wow. movie. So he was three. So I was, I think I hold the, you know, I don't think the distinction, but I'm certainly, no doubt in my mind, I'm the, the guy that was the youngest at the time when we did it, you know, that, that wrote one of these films. So it was really just, you know, such a blessing, an honor, a thrill of a lifetime to be able to, to do this. You know, it just, I had to keep pinching myself. Like, is this happening? You know, but I think the moment where it felt all very real and, you know, like this really is happening was when Donald Pleasance walked onto the scene and, and there he was, you know, with the, with the trench coat and the, <laughs> the whole thing, you know, and, and, and it was Lubis and he, there he is saying the dialogue that I had written for him, which I do remember being the most intimidating part of the process, the writing process for me was trying to emulate, you know, the, 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 the style of the character and what John Carpenter and Deborah Hill had created so brilliantly. Um, you know, and I just, you know, you just don't feel worthy that you can kind of put these Shakespearean words in this actor's mouth. <laughs> He's so brilliant. Right. Um, but also very kind, very funny. Everybody loved him. You know, um, he was obviously getting on in years at that point. So it was a tremendous loss when he passed, you know, before the movie was sort of officially completed, which I know opens a whole other part of the conversation. But, yeah. um, but you know, the whole thing was just like a dream come true, really. Yeah, I, I I can only imagine, and and um, 
uh, like I told you before we started this, you know, I, I, I like both versions. Um, I was uh, a fan of the film when it came out in the theater and uh, with a very mm-hmm. confusing ending. And uh, right. And yeah. then years and years later, I, I was one of those guys that got one of the bootleg versions of the producer's cut. Mm-hmm. It was the only way of getting yep. it. And now well, it's out. Let me tell you, because there, there was never a day or a week or a month that went by in my life during that period of time where I wasn't getting some email or text message from some fan somewhere in the world wondering when they're going to be able to buy the producer's cut. So I, you know, I bow to Scream Factory, Shout Factory, and those guys over there that that finally, finally made it happen. Um, and they did such a beautiful job. I mean, the transfer was was perfect. And oh, yeah. It just looked, it looked great. And I couldn't have been happier and more relieved, to be honest. I'd still get those questions about that cut, but not as many as I used to. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thrilled that it's kind of found another sort of life on, on Blu-ray. And I think it's also part of the, the box set that they did, I think, last year. Um, so it's just great that, you know, after all these years, this movie's still talked about. I had no idea at the time that, I'd be asked questions about it 25 plus years after the fact and or that the fact that the series would go on as long as it has. It's, a, it's amazing to me yeah. that it's just it has had the legs that it has. When we did six, people were like, you're making six of them. What? What's <laughs> happening? You know, like, you know, like it, it just didn't like things just didn't go on that long. And the fact that it's gone on twice as long now is just mind blowing to me. Which version do you prefer, theatrical or producer? That was a trick, tricky one for me because, you know, neither one for me ever really represented the vision I had as the writer of what the movie was going to look like, what it was going to feel like, what the sort of vibe of the thing was going to be. You know, I, I felt like even initially when they were shooting the what we call the producer's cut, um, when they were on you know, location in Utah and shooting that. And I was invited for part of that time. Um, but I just felt like even from the get-go, there were certain, I'm not going to name names, but there were certain people involved, uh, probably more on the studio level, but also some of the more production side of things. Um, not the Akkads, but you know, some of the, I'll call them the coordinators and people that sort of made the on-the-ground decisions about things. Um, just didn't see what we were making you know to them it was like another job another one of those movies you know and for me it was you know not only was it just such a dream come true and I was so young and thrilled um but I just knew you know like the fans expect a certain thing a certain quality a certain level a certain amount of tension suspense misdirection you know and I just felt like a lot of the stuff that was in the script that attended to those ideas just was being kind of let go or cut out because of time, budget, whatever you want to call it, you know, whatever the issue was. And believe me, as a filmmaker now, I get time and budget. So it was your, your enemy, but um, yes, they are, but it was also, it was an important movie for me, you know, not just career wise, but it was important for me emotionally you know, I wanted it to be good. We wanted it to be great. You know, we were a bunch of young kids, you know, kind of given this opportunity. I know Marianne Hagen, who played Kara Strode, is, was such a uh, vocal fan of, of the script and, and what it intended to be. And, and, the, and probably the most, you know, kind of the biggest cheerleader of the material was, was Paul Rudd, you know, young Paul Rudd. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, man, there we were all. Known. <laughs> and man himself, you know, just has become a superstar and, and I adore the guy and, and he's just, you know, was always as gracious and funny and witty and caring about everybody that he is still to this day. So that makes me happy to see one of the good guys made it. Um, but, you know, I just think, we all just kind of were like, wait, you know, that's why are we calling cut now? The the scene's not finished. You know, so it all felt half baked to me, even that first version. So when you ask me the question of like, what do I think is better? I say neither, you know, (laughs) know, (laughs) it it never was the movie that in my mind, I, I envisioned it to be. I think there are things about, the producers cut there are certainly better, closer to the the mark of what we intended, but it just all felt rushed, you know, and it didn't feel like we were telling the story that should have been told. 
and that's not, I think people will argue, oh, you're giving them a motive, you're giving them this, you're giving them that. Like, well, all of that stuff was set up. You know, it was all in, at least in Halloween 2, certainly Halloween 4. I even went back yeah. to the novelization of the original movie to kind of pull from some of that mythology that was was kind of all hinted at, but not really developed. You know, and then the other thing I was sort of saddled with, and you know, I've talked about this many times, was the the man in black, the mysterious stranger character from the end of Halloween Five that you know kind of wanders around that movie in a black duster and a you know looking like John Wayne coming to town. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, with the, with the spurs on his boots, you know, he's kind of like the dark sheriff or whatever. And kicks and, you know, a nobody... dog. <laughs> and he kicked a dog. That's right. He yeah, how, a dog. how dare he I mean, kick a dog? Oh yeah, that's like the cardinal sin in any any horror movies. You, you we knew he was evil. Dog. I mean, I, you know, I motivated the whole John Wick series was he killed the dog. Exactly. Um, right. So um, yeah, so yeah, I, I just think you know there were a lot of there was a lot of baggage you know kind of coming with that assignment, but there was also for me it was like let's get this back to the essence of the original movie and and like it make it more about the suspense and I didn't really design any like like thrilling set piece like murders like the you know like now it's like if michael isn't killing somebody every you know whatever three minutes and and it has to be in the most sort of you know over the top disgusting way i, I just didn't write that <laughs> script because to me the original movie wasn't that he was more of a he was clever he was like a child playing halloween tricks on his victims as he sort of set them up you know, on the phone and with a telephone cord and hiding in the closet. And, you know, so all, he's kind of fucking with the, all these victims. And that's really what I wanted to bring back to the, the essence of it. And that's what was a lot of that stuff was in the screenplay and it just didn't, it never made it to film. Yeah, they they say there's the film you write and there's the film you make. So I guess that was for sure. Definitely, yeah, yeah. On on this, I well, and, and also in our case, it was also the film that they released, which was so far removed from anything. You know, like the studio got involved, and they ordered these like five days of like terrible reshoots, and and that sort of culminated in the you know for me the disastrous theatrical cut of this film. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking that. There are some moments in that I think that are are okay, um, but for me, it just was all kind of just cheesy and over the top, and like you know, I felt like we had an opportunity over those five days to sort of like go back and insert the stuff that was in the script originally that didn't make it for time and money reasons. So I was thinking, well, they're, they're going to spend more money and they're going to spend more time. Maybe we're going to go back and get this thing right. And instead of that, they just went the opposite direction, you know, and made it into oh. some like cheesy yeah. sci-fi channel. I don't even know. You know like I mean, people ask me all the time, like what were the babies in the fish tanks? I have no idea didn't write it didn't have any idea <laughs> what they were what they were you know and that's the tr the tricky part and the you know, you know people think that you know it's your name on the screen so it's got to be representative of what you intended and that's not always true yeah a lot of the times it, it it seems like the um if the film is great the director gets the credit if the film is horrible the writer it's gets the writer. destroyed. Exactly. It's a, a very old Hollywood adage. I think it's like William Goldman stuff, you know? <laughs> but, yeah. But, uh, you know, listen, again, I now after all these years, you know, I have a very different perspective on it. I mean, I can hem and haw all day long and tell you what was different and what was intended and what was not intended. You know, for me, it was just, wow, what a thrilling piece of chapter, little chapter of my life, you know? And, and for that to be my first kind of major film credit was, just a real honor and, and and a thrill of a lifetime to have been a part of it. Yeah, I mean, it definitely has a, a massive history compared to some of the other ones. And I think that it's a, mm -hmm. a huge step up from part five. Um, oh, well, thanks. I think is I mean, the things worst. Things part five that I think are good. I, I, I tend to see the good stuff in everything. <laughs> I, you know, I say the, the same thing. You know, and, and, yeah. And, uh, I, love, I love the series, so I can find good parts of Halloween five. I mean, cookie woman, you know, <laughs> <laughs> gotta love cookie. Uh, but, um, but no, there's some good, I mean, actually that, that one scene in the, in the garbage chute where, you know, the, the or laundry chute, I guess it is that little Daniel Harris oh, yeah. is like trapped in and he's like, it's like, that is terrifying and really well done. So, you know, there's, there's moments in all of the movies that I think kind of like really are elevated and, and really fantastically conceived. I think there's one scene in Halloween 6 that I, I will always hold up as kind of like the trophy moment of that movie is the, the, I call it the rear window 
moment, you know, where she's looking across the way through the lens and she sees the shape coming up behind the girl in the window. And then all of a sudden, oh, her own little kid is walking into the house and boom, you know, it's like that just to me is exemplifies you know, what the intention of that entire movie was, which was kind of like fear, suspense, thrilling, um, and just the way that was shot. It was just beautiful. Yeah, I mean, there there are definite moments. And uh, one of them for me would be Don Shanks, who I then became a big fan of and uh, met him at mm-hmm. a convention a long time ago when right. they were promoting part five. And he signed a picture right, for me right. of him as Michael. And he was very nice. You know, he, he actually took time to talk to me. And since then, whenever I see his right. name, I'm like, oh, oh, Don Shanks. There's Don Shanks again. Right. And it was great well, seeing you him know, in, you know, I know, I'll know what you always did last summer. Or no, I always uh-huh, will know what right? you did last summer as the fisherman. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And, yep, uh, yep, yeah, that's right. So, I forgot about that. That's true. I didn't know Don. I, I think I met him at one of the shows. I, you know, they've done a couple, well, there's a couple. They've done like four or five of them now. These kind of like every five years, they do this like official Halloween convention here in California and um, take the fans to the original locations. And they just, it's kind of like a nice reunion for everybody across the franchise. And it's, it's just amazing to me, like the people that you meet and you all kind of, you know, we're all part of this weird dysfunctional family, but <laughs> a lot of us don't even know each other or haven't met until these conventions. So it's 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 really it's just fun and, and I'm just again it's just there's there's nothing about the experience that I look back on and I'm bitter about or I just want to you know deny that I you know there's some people that it can be like that and I just I've chosen to sort of take the high road with all of it and I just feel like what a great thing to have experienced at such a young right. age you know and uh, um, it just you know it was it was really like against all odds that that even happened. Yeah, I, I think that uh, people now look back on these things and they appreciate them in, in a whole new way. At the time, they may just be, you know, hyperbolic about it. And, and right. you know, it yeah. destroyed yeah, exactly. my life, right. you know, type of thing. But oh, I know. I know. I know. When well, it's also, I think a cult, we live in a culture now where it's just, you know, people aren't happy if they're not, you know, sitting on some platform bitching and moaning about something, you know. Oh, so yeah. It's just we unfortunately <laughs> live in a time where people are hypercritical, hypersensitive, you know, it's just something that I, I acknowledge it, but I also don't let it get in the way of what I'm doing. You know, you, you, everybody, ha- you have to move forward and you have to kind of tell things, tell stories the way that you intend to tell them. And if some, you know, I think that's the whole thing with art is it's subjective and right. um, I'm not here to explain it, you know, and, and, and justify anything, you know, if anything, I think if, if art doesn't provoke an, an emotion and whether it's anger or if it's your, you know, again, like with, with Michael Myers, it's become kind of like a thrill ride movie. Um, outrage is the one I've become familiar <laughs> with certain, certain things. Um, but, you know, I, I think that re- the reaction is whatever it's going to be, you know, that's, that's not the job of the filmmaker to say how anybody should or could, you know, should, should react to a piece of material, whether it's a painting or it's a, a play, a book, a movie, whatever. It's just, you, you, you tell it and people will react. And that's, that's the point. I think, I think art should be dangerous too, in some ways, you know, I don't think it should be so, you know, paint by the numbers, and right. safe. So, you know, uh, but again, you know, being conscious and vigilant of the fact that we are in a world where people are um, easily offended, easily moved to threaten acts of violence, I'll even say. Oh, uh, yeah. Because they don't yeah. like them. So, yeah, that, that that's really disturbing is. to me. You know, I think that we live in a really dangerous time uh, because you can be killed for what you say, for what you think. Well, yeah, and and just being a character. I mean, you you always hear actors saying that they get death threats because p- fans think Absolutely. they are that person, and they're like, "No, I'm yep. Bob. I'm playing a character named Joe. You know, I'm yep. I'm a nice guy. Yep. Why are you no, threatening to kill true. me?" Yep. I mean, Evan Peters just recently played Jeffrey Dahmer, and you know, won the Golden Globe. Good for him. He did an amazing job playing that character. Yeah, that was good. Um, but you know, it was tons of backlash. You know, and and um, you know, Blonde last year that that you know created quite a stir over their portrayal of Marilyn Monroe. 
Um, some people just aren't going to like it. And some people are going to, you know, have all kinds of finger pointing and accusations, but you know, you kind of just can't give it any credibility, you know, it's like, and then, you know, cause some people are going to get it and some people are just not, um, you know, there's nothing that I've ever made, especially in the world of true crime or whatever you want to call it, even though none of these movies to me are reflective of like what the true crime was. It wasn't supposed to be a podcast. Um, but you know, I think any, there's no room for interpretation anymore, you know, and, and that's scary to me. You, Why, you can't, you, you can't do anything without yeah, somebody it, wanting, wanting to kill you literally. Well, especially when it's with such a, a huge IP. I mean, if you're, if you're right, if it's one thing that's by itself and it's completely original, that's one thing. But when you have mm-hmm. something like the Halloween franchise, where yeah. you know that started in 78 and now has gone all the way up to yep. like 2022 right i mean if you right. do make something that somebody doesn't like that's your your life is over basically you know we you know well, yeah you, i mean i think there's all kinds of you know i think there was there was a real divisive kind of reaction to the last movie the halloween ends movie with david gordon green did all three obviously and you know i think for a minute he was like the hero and then now to the, the fan base like He's vilified for making that movie. I, he I, made the movie he wanted to make. You know, he's I'm not one of those. Away yeah. Anything from anyone else. You know, he's not. He's not. He's not taking away from your enjoyment of one or six or nine or <laughs> resurrection, <laughs> whatever you right. like. You know, he's yeah, just told a story that he he wanted to tell. And you know, I mean, I may have loved parts of it. I may have not loved parts of it. It's just. It's it just. You can't. You just kind of can't crucify people for their point of view and and that's just sadly what happens today well but you also have kind of on the other end of that though you now have like the filmmakers and the actors and actresses now coming out and attacking the fans and i think that doesn't Mm -hmm. help things so with something like halloween ends which i did not like Mm -hmm. i loved his first one didn't Mm -hmm. not like kills because i couldn't stand the whole evil dies tonight thing and then oh, it was just well. too much. And then, yeah, then okay. ends just did not work with me at all. But then they criticized us on, but, you know, on the internet. Well, okay, I, I get your opinion, but what, what does that have to do with them attacking fans? I've never heard of that. Who's attacking a fan? Well, like a, a lot of the, so like, okay, for example, um, Velma, that new show. So people are attacking No, I'm talking about it. David Gordon Green. I, we're, we're talking about Halloween. Where did David Gordon Green ever attack fans? I'm just, oh, I just don't know. Maybe you can educate me. It's basically, there, there were a couple times in, not in like interviews, but there have been articles with him saying okay. that he is, like kind of like what you just said, he's going to make what he wants to make. It, you know, it's mm-hmm. not really, it's not what the fans want. He even acknowledged that the fans would mm-hmm. not like the last movie. And so it okay. was kind of like, well, I'm going to make what I want. That's mm-hmm. your problem if you don't like it. And I think fans are kind of like, well, whoa, he's... wait a minute, you know. Well, he's right. <laughs> it is your problem if you don't like it. <laughs> it's not, he's, not, he's not here to make everybody happy. That's True. not what it's about. He just told a story that he wanted to tell. I mean, listen, I would have made different choices. I, I, I don't think that that's, that's not the movie I would have told. And I also think when you're... You know, I hate to say, but, you know, Halloween movies are like McDonald's now. Like, you have to make the same thing over and over. And if you don't, you know, well, I I didn't come here for this, you know, Walker. I came here for a Big Mac. <laughs> you know, like, like there's a certain expectation of what you're going to get. And I think he defied that. I think some people kind of love that, 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 you know, like Halloween 3. You, I don't know how old you are, but that was reviled when that movie came out. Absolutely. Oh, if, if the internet yeah. existed then, I guarantee you. Tommy Lee Wallace would be hunted like for his <laughs> head for having made that movie. Today, people see it, see, like you said, they just sort of see it differently. And, you know, time kind of becomes its friend, you know, and, and, and even with six, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, we, we were on the cusp of the internet when that came out. So we didn't get that kind of crazy backlash, but I can imagine today, like it would be absolute nightmare. It would be hell on earth for me if that movie came out today. Um, yeah. But yeah, but yeah. no, I hear what you're saying. Well, I mean, I, I think I think there has to be a certain level of like, hey, I'm building this widget because this is part of this thing. I can't go off and do whatever I want. 
Um, so maybe that was a bit of the mistake of this last movie. Um, but again, I just think people take it too far. You know, this, I, they call it toxic fandom, whatever. I <laughs> even screamed, made a movie about it. Um, it's, just, it's too much. It's like, get over it. Like when I was a kid, I had to take ride my bike to the newsstand to pick up a copy of Fangoria, which was published like four times a year, just to see what movies might be coming out. Like we didn't know anything about any of it. So it's just, it's too much information. Fanhood is great, but they like, the fact that they know more about the movie before it's even made is to me just kind of weird and, and, and over the top. Yeah, I, I I would agree with it. I, I think that since this last trilogy was made maybe by the same person, and you know, you can include, mm-hmm. you know, Danny McBride and 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 I'm a huge fan of, sure. of all their stuff. I mean, I I love the stuff mm-hmm. they do for yeah. HBO, I love their movies. And so when I heard that right. they were gonna be doing Halloween, I was really excited. And, and like I said, I love the first mm-hmm. one. But when you have maybe one person doing three, they get attacked a little bit more than if let's say Halloween four is Dwight H. Little, and then you have part five, and then I'm I'm not trying to pronounce that director's name, but he's a French director who... Yeah, yeah, maybe he didn't exactly understand the Halloween series, where like Dwight H. Little was a director for hire, and then you have Joe Chappelle, who did part six, and according to that Halloween 25 years later, he basically took it to just get like a deal with Dimension. When I, mean, I think it's, yeah. I think it looks People great. Take these things, but, that's not, but that's not true. You know what I mean? Like everybody wants to think they know something because they heard it on a podcast or they want to watch it on a documentary. There's a piece of that that's a fact. He did get a deal, but that's not the reason he made the movie. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like people sure. want to just accuse so quickly and kick people around. It's just horrible to me. Absolutely horrible. And I'm going to be on my high horse here, but just Joe Chappelle did not make the movie for the reason that people go around saying that he made it he, 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 they don't know joe they never met him never spoken to him so how right. do they know anything no, they don't know anything and you know then i get that too for things i've done you don't know me you've never walked in my shoes you don't know where my heart is you don't know the kind of person i am um you don't know where i've been in my life but stop pretending you know something because you oh don't. yeah no that's why i'm and saying they, about they say tell. i'm not defending the, every all the decisions he made i think he was a young filmmaker he wanted to you know make, get his foot into the door in hollywood he got an opportunity to make more movies with the people that financed halloween six and he took it <laughs> i don't know many young filmmakers that wouldn't have oh but, no you know and i have no problem deem- with that at all i'm not saying you are but i'm just saying he's yeah. been really demonized over the years and it's not fair um so no cool. i yeah i liked phantoms and and if somebody said hey if you make this movie you get like a three picture deal here I, okay sure right. why not i mean woody allen used who to make that That's deal all the time who, who wouldn't do it and i don't think he's you know i don't think he's a bad person because of it. he's a no, father I don't either. he's a husband he's a son you know like we're all human beings and i just we just live in a world now where people are like dehumanized for p- works of art that they make i don't get it no, and, and I completely agree with that because, like I said, I brought up Woody Allen and the studio would say, OK, you make this like you make these two more kind of commercial movies. We then will mm-hmm. back your art movie. So right, and then he'd right, be like, right. OK, fine. So we got two that were more commercial and then we got his mm-hmm. another woman you know, or one of, you right, know, right, one of those right. types of movies. I mean, so Woody Allen's a tough one because I think, you know, we live also, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that have come out about a lot of people, including, you know, yeah. obviously most famously, <laughs> Harvey Weinstein, who oh, yeah. is exactly where he belongs. You know, and it's a whole other conversation. I know I don't mean to get too heady about all of this, <laughs> but, but, you know, like that's the thing is like, there are some bad people out there. Yes. And, but I just think it's wrong to like villainize or demonize somebody because you didn't like the movie they made. If they do terrible things in their private life, I get it. You know, let the chips fall where they will. But like the whole notion of like, I hate Zack Snyder, you know, <laughs> let him die. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, you know, there's, there's, there's always something. And I think the bigger you become, the bigger movies you make, the more hatred you sort of in, engender in your, in your career. I think some of it's jealousy. I think some of it's just, ignorance i think some of it's the fact that people are really unhappy 
Yeah, and didn't Jamie Kennedy do a whole documentary about people who wanted to kill him for doing like Son of the Mask and he went around interviewing all yeah, these internet you people? You might be wow, you might be right. I don't know, but I, I, maybe I'm just out of the loop. I haven't I don't even know about this documentary, but now I gotta go find that. <laughs> yeah, I believe it was um, him. And and he he shows wow. you on the screen like you should make this because you made this film, you should die. Or why don't you commit suicide? Mm-hmm. And he's like, wow, mm-hmm. what, why well, do all these I mean, people hate me? Right. Jar Jar Binks, you know, I mean, this poor man who, you know, was like handed this gift of being in a star Wars movie. And he literally almost took his own life. Yeah. Because of the backlash against him. It's just, it's really hard to not take some of that stuff personally. When you think like people fucking hate me. You know, and I've been a part of that. I've been victim of it. I've been, you know, kind of called all kinds of things. And, you know, ultimately it just comes down to self-esteem and just knowing who you are, um, you know, because people will want to drag you down. That's, that's the way the world is. And it's sad. Well, but what's interesting about that is like you have for the prequels, you have like the actor Armand Best, I believe. And then you, yeah. you mm-hmm. have, you know, like, um, Oh, I'm blanking. Uh, 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 played Darth Vader and yeah, Anakin. Oh, Dar- yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Christensen. Yeah, Christensen. So then you have like they're vilified, and and oh, all yeah. of a sudden, right for dec- for like a couple decades, and then all of a sudden Obi Wan Kenobi comes out, and it's right, like, oh my right. god, they got him back. Are this is back great. And- Again, like it's that it's that nostalgia thing. I, I just call it what it is. <laughs> like the fact that you, you know, as an example, want to talk about Halloween Six and say that you own both. Like it's amazing to me. Like like there there was never any love for that movie for many many years, <laughs> and now there just is. It's not like it's the most beloved, but I think it's one that that fans kind of they kind of know the backstory and little pieces of it and um kind of what happened and i think they see some of the good in it and oh, so many people write to me um and be, and it's meaningful to them because it was the first one that they saw in theaters you know as a kid or their parents took them to see it or they snuck in with their friends or so i get all of that i was the kid that snuck in to see halloween two and three so, <laughs> um you know so i really i get it you know but i just i i don't know i think it's just we live in this weird culture now where you know it's just there's got to be somebody almost every day that the internet wants to pick on and right i just you know i don't get it It, it's gross to me it's unsettling it's wrong and all those people should honestly they're the ones that should be ashamed well and and sometimes like the story of of halloween six doesn't get out until Mm -hmm. much later kind of like silent night deadly night part two was so hated Mm -hmm. And I didn't like it when it first came out. I'm like, why is all this footage in here? And what, what uh, they're ripping me off. Right, and, right, right. and then all of a sudden, yeah. Yeah. the director starts talking, the actors start talking, and mm-hmm. the producer starts talking. And then you realize, oh, this is why the movie was made. Now I like it. Mm-hmm. Now it's right. one of my favorite. Yeah, I, I mean, I maybe there's films. some of that. I mean, I've I've done a lot of press. I mean, even at the time, though, I think Fangoria contacted me right after the movie came out. And we they did a, a not a big story, but they did a, a sort of a sidebar on, if I remember, on kind of that there was, you know, pro- there were problems with, you know, the, the final version and what have you and what my reaction was. And so that was out there. It was out there for a while. But again, it just is pre-internet, pre where everything is just kind of like right there for your immediate consumption. But um, again, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't hold any kind of grudges or <laughs> kind of in this time of my life is anything, but honestly, the gift that it was and, and everything since, you know, it's all been a gift to me. So, you know, people can say whatever they want to say. And, you know, and I, I still just make a choice to be a happy person and to treat people with respect in my life. Yeah, and that makes sense. And especially now with uh, places like Scream Factory and all that, releasing all these in box sets so that you got the producer's cut. Yeah. And you got all this stuff. Yep. It it kind of brings the, it elevates the film up. So it's now you I can agree. appreciate and, it. And little did I know, we'd be in a box set with like 10 other movies. <laughs> just, yeah. I, I giggle because it's just so weird to me that, that, that this, you know, I mean... I, Again, like I said, when we made six people, I just in the industry were like six of these movies, like what? <laughs> you know, it just seemed ridiculous. 
And now it's just, you know, it's and now they're kind of heralded, you know, and Jamie Lee Curtis is this major star and she's just going to big film festivals around the world and promoting. <laughs> right. I just chuckle because it's just to me like, weirdly enough, like validation, like the fact that, you know, you, you're one of those, you know, you get it. We grew up with these movies and you love them and people often would kind of look down on them, these kind of films or people who like these kind of films. And now oh, they yeah. just feel more accepted by the mainstream maybe which maybe doesn't make them as fun because <laughs> there's something there's something kind of subversive about liking those films back in those days why well, I, I have now to it's convince... just kind of all part of pop culture oh yeah. yeah yeah and i and i i've had to and to a point still today convince people that horror is really the way to go if you want to actually send some sort of message or an allegory or something like you can dawn mm -hmm. of the dead mm -hmm. You know, the original Dawn of the yeah, Dead about, totally. you know, consumerism or, you know, mm -hmm. the original Night of Living Dead would be communism or Day of the Dead would be all about the decade of decadence. And, and that there's right, right. these hidden things in there that you wouldn't get in, let's say, necessarily a comedy unless it was about that subject. So, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, That's a lot true. of I mean, stuff, horror's always been a great, you know, kind of. I don't know, kind of, you know, lightning rod for all kinds of wild ideas and commentaries on, you know, whether it's from Vietnam, the Vietnam War, you know, and, and with Chainsaw right. and Night of the Living Dead and all of those films that were kind of like a direct sort of knee jerk reaction to what was going on culturally um, and politically in the world. So I think that, you know, and there's been books written about that and nightmares and red white and blue and, and documentaries like so many things that have kind of like and even the shining documentary which i thought was like off the rails crazy but fascinating um you know the things that people will the symbols and the things that people will find among layers and layers of these these things were honestly intentionally it was like oh we just happened to have a can of soup that was sitting <laughs> right it's like there was never an attention <laughs> but, but people will read into it i think that's what's great i think that's that's what art is you know that's what you see and that's that's okay i think that's what that's why it's there and it's why it's life for me and well that, we all love it so much but when yeah, it turns into like again like like toxic boiling over oh, yeah. ridiculous reaction then i get like whoa what is freaking happening in the world Anyhow, yeah, it's it's that's why I, I like David Lynch is he won't explain anything. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, you figure it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> he shouldn't. And yeah. I, you know, nobody, no artist, no great. He's a great artist, um, but no artist should explain what you meant. You know, and this, that, and the other. Like, what are these things? It's just it takes all of the subjectivity out of it. And the art is meant to be subjective, and and you 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 take from it what you bring to your life experience. You know, and we all come from the different places in our, our lives, different families, different cultures, backgrounds, continents even. But I think, you know, yeah, you know, emotions like, like horror and fear, it's just universal. And I think, again, that's why I think horror films are so popular and we all can relate on that level of what, you know, what's, what's, who is that man behind that featureless mask? You know, if we project a million things onto a Michael Myers or a Jason Voorhees or, you know, I think we all kind of, we all were born with primal fears of snakes and death and drowning. And, you know, there's a million different things that we all collectively can agree are not good. <laughs> we don't want to go out that way. Right. Um, and I think these movies in a way kind of attend to that, you know, that very basic elemental fear we have of, of death and, and not knowing um, it, it, what, if anything, is on the other side. Pain, suffering, illness, loss, you know, I think that's, these are all these common things that people struggle with every day on this planet. And, and I think that's what, that's what these movies are talking about. They're, you know, whether it's a guy in a mask or it's the shark in the ocean or the, you know, the devil, you know, uh, in the little girl, it's, we're all collect it's collectively talking about what fear is and what uh, the unknown is. Yeah. Oh, and, and I agree with that. So that, Talking about the unknown would then be a, a good segue into Amityville. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so I think that would be, per, you know, that's a good place to, uh, uh, to go from here. And you can't see it, but I do own, and I'm showing this to our audience, an Amityville Horror coffee mug that's got the poster all oh. around it. And because cool. I, I am a super fan of Amityville Horror. I own 
every mm. one that you could nice. possibly get, I own it. Some oh my of my, God, you must have a whole shelf with all of these in-name only Amityville ripoffs, I call them, you know, the, the, the mockbuster versions of yes. people have kind of commandeered the word Amityville and made a bunch of movies in their bathroom. <laughs> I I know several of them who made it, a few of them very well, oh, yeah, and I'll okay. probably be making my okay. own uh, next year. Okay, but uh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's. I love the series so much. It's like you know, why not? You know, and and if you can. Well, here's the thing, though. It's not a. It's, that's not the series. The series are is the first movie, and then a few of the other ones that were officially right. licensed. None of those are the series. I don't mean to be like you know corrective or whatever <laughs> from the legal <laughs> point of view, but none of those movies with the word Amityville slapped on the cover of the video are Amityville horror movies. So there are only a few of them um, that were licensed by the people that actually own the copyright to the first, you know, the book and and that first film. So, um, but I've been fortunate enough to, to know them in real life and they have kind of made me their weird, weirdly made me their steward of the rights that they do, you know, retain. And, you know, I've been fortunate to kind of, you know, be a part of a couple of the other movies that I guess we'll just call them the authorized licensed versions of the, of the story that they originally experienced, you know, in real life. And, you know, that's been up for debate. There's another thing, you know, like when the internet came about, boy, did they get kicked around even more um, for, you know, telling their story. Yeah. And, and you're, you're definitely the guy to talk to about it because you have, of course, the Amityville murders, and then you were mm -hmm. one of the producers yeah. on Amityville, the awakening, and you have yes. two, um, History's Mysteries, um, which would be yep. Amityville the Haunting and Amityville Horror or Hoax. I've seen Amityville Haunting and then the two movies. So I, okay. I have to ask, do you believe this all happened or do you think it was like a hoax? I definitely don't think it was a hoax, but what I will tell you is there was nothing about the people that lived it, the Lux family, that that conspired to create a hoax they were they did nothing they had nothing in their mind like let's go cash in on this ever and i'll tell you what i you know from my own personal and personal my personal and uh first-hand kind of knowledge and and relationship with that family is that something really scared them i can't tell you what it was i wasn't there I was a little kid when all of this happened i was just like anybody else you know like reading the tabloids and the book you know kids reading the book in the, <laughs> in the playground and things like that at the time but um but no something really scared the living daylights out of that family and it never really left them it, it, it was something that they dealt with every day of their lives until sadly they passed away both george and kathy had, have left us um but i can tell you from my just own personal interactions with them George, in particular, you know, was very happy-go-lucky, jokey, generous, uh, kind of like, you know, the uncle that you want, a cool uncle you want to hang around with all the time. Um, nothing splashy or showy about him. He lived in Las Vegas fixing old cars and computers and things like that. He was not a, he had not cashed in and made millions of dollars on this. But I'll tell you this, whenever the, 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 the topic of that house came into the conversation, which wasn't all the time. But when it did, you just saw this light in him extinguish, like a dark cloud just passed over his head. And he was absolutely like the energy. It's hard to even put it in words, like watching somebody go from like animated and fun to shoulders slumped in, head bowed down, eyes taking on this different tone. But it just like everything about this person was shit. When he just, just the slightest, mention of the house or what happened there interesting he was truly affected by it. yeah he said it his rosary every day of his life he wouldn't go to bed without it without saying it it turned he wasn't a religious person until it happened um and then you know he felt like the, the priest had gotten involved in that story he really to me always said that he saved our lives by telling us to get out when we did so when you hear so, yeah like the so you believe something happened you just don't know entirely you know i wasn't there i, I can yeah. tell you it's something scared the living shit out of these people and that's that's that i can tell you they were they were truly scared and terrified by what happened and and whatever it was they experienced in the house whether it was a mass hallucination or but i don't i can tell you it wasn't some conspiracy to defraud the public 
that that was the furthest thing from their minds. And I think that people, if you look closely at the story and kind of all of the naysayers, each and every one of those people that kind of went public with the accusation it was all a big hoax, they all had something to gain by saying that. The lawyer of Ronald DeFeo, William Weber, was kind of like, kind of like, call him like the circus barker of the whole thing. You know, he had a motive to say it was a hoax because he didn't make the share of the money he thought he, want, he was going to make off of their story. He wanted to do a book deal with them and they walked. Yeah, because the, so, the... And there was, a, there was a whole slew of characters that came out. You know, I come with Johnny come late, lately of the thing who just, you know, kind of wanted to attach their names to the whole Amityville of it all. I, no offense, but even the people who make these in-name only Amityville movies, what are they trying to do? They're trying to attach their names to something that became famous. This family had no idea it was going to become famous. Right. The way they met the book publisher was Kathy's hairdresser said, oh, I know somebody who publishes books. That's how that happened. She was like getting her hair done. Huh. So there was no like, oh, let's let's call our connections in Hollywood and <laughs> make a big deal. <laughs> they had no idea what they were doing. And I think that was part of the reason they also kind of made bad deals, you know, because they didn't know what they were doing. So that's the reason why people can walk, go out and make movies that say Amityville and, and, and honestly fool the public into thinking it has something to do with the Amityville horror when it doesn't, because they didn't protect it. It was almost like George uh, Romero with Night of the Living Dead. He didn't really protect it legally. And so there was never any real copyright to that. It was sort of similar to what they did with their deal. Although the book and the movie and all that, the original one, were, were, had a copyright to them, but, but it just wasn't done properly. And if they had been, you know, hoaxers and, you know, you, they would have made damn sure they got their share of the money. They didn't. Yeah, I, you know, my, my thing for wanting to make something is, I think, different from some of the other people's is, it'd be mm -hmm. kind of like me oh, wanting no, I'm not, to I'm not that. judging it. I'm just saying. Oh, I'm no, just, no, no. I'm, I'm no. Not none of that. It's, I'm just saying, like, there is that kind of, like, people want to be a part of, associated with something that's well known. And I think that's. Amityville is easy because it's the name of a town. Everybody can make a movie called Amityville, apparently. So, <laughs> anyway, well, sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, I mean there, there is there's part of kind of being a, a part of a legacy, let's say that it's. So for me, it's more of a love for Amityville that I, mm -hmm. you know, I I obviously love the original movies and and I even include you know like um, Amityville Dollhouse and all that stuff because of you know right right it's right. kind of after that is where it gets really iffy but it would almost be like if i wanted to make a friday the 13th or a halloween is i have a love for it so i would want to do it so for me it's like well let me do something that it's it's my idea is amityville camp out and the cursed item because so many of these movies deal with cursed items is a tent and when all the action is happening and everybody's dying the guy looks down and it says the property of ronnie defeo and they're just okay. like, oh, my God, this is from the Amityville house. You know, they finally realize uh -huh. that through. the. So there's that connection to the other movies instead of making a ghost movie and just tacking on the name Amityville. You know, that gotcha. to me, that's the difference. And, and so some people do it, I think, because they like the series. Some people, I think, do it for the money. Some people just want the name. So I think that there's a variety of, of different things of, of doing it. Mm hmm. Well, how did you yeah, get involved? I mean, I think, oh, I mean, you know, it was it was what you had mentioned, you know, one of the, the, the projects you had mentioned, it was the Histories, Mysteries, those two, there were really, it was one documentary, we split it in half. Um, uh, one they called The Haunting, the other one was called Haunting or, ha Haunting or Horror or Hoax, I think is what they ended up calling it. Um, but it was the first time in, I think, 25 years that anybody had gotten the Lutzes to speak about it. You know, again, like they had just gone on with their lives. Like I said, George Lutz was living quietly in Las Vegas, <laughs> fixing motorcycles and cars and building computers and just living a very quiet, retired life. And, and then I called him one day and said, hey, you know, I want to do this documentary and kind of hear what you guys have to say about this after all these years. And it took some, you know, getting to know him. He didn't want to just do it. Um, so I had to really kind of build a trust with him and and uh unfortunately that has lasted at least with his family all these years um but you know it, it, that was the beginning of it all it was and and kind of like what you said you know i had a, a love of the, the the film i'd always heard it was true and then you heard the stories oh maybe it wasn't so true 
but I just kind of wanted to do my own little investigation. And I thought, well, how interesting, you know, it's been 25, I was almost 25 years at that point. And I thought, well, let's, let's resurrect it in the form of a documentary that we can kind of bring all of the people who were ever a part of it into one kind of thing, you know, and kind of like a forum where everybody tells their story. And at the end, you know, <laughs> it's David Lynch, like, uh, let the audience decide what they want to believe. Cause I, I just don't think you can, unless you were there to experience it, you'll, you'll never know what went on in that house during the 28 days they lived there. I mean, we do know that Ronnie DeFeo murdered his entire family with a, right. with a hunting rifle, which should have been heard and three miles in every direction, the one gunshot, not a single member of the family woke up when he, when he fired that gun, not a single neighbor reported at the time hearing any of those gunshots. It's just a crazy, really weird, baffling, creepy story. Um, and I think the fact that, again, it happened in a, to an American family or two of them in a very small, very kind of quiet community, beautiful home on the water, any, everything that you could ever want was there, you know, that he, and that's what the Lutzes thought when they bought it. They're like, wow, <laughs> this is, we can't believe what we're getting, what we're getting. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge house. It's a beautiful well. house. Beautiful home. It's three thousand square feet, I think, maybe thirty five hundred. Um, again, it's facing the water. There was a built in pool. There was a garage. There was a finished basement. There was a boathouse. I mean, what more could be? You know, it's like it literally was the American dream to own a home like that. And you know, unfortunately for them, you know, not to sound too much like a movie poster, but it you know, really turned into a nightmare for them. And all of that was you know, told and retold in so many different ways. And people think like, oh, in the movie, you know, the windows exploded and those windows didn't explode. That was a hoax. They made up the whole story. Well, it was a movie. <laughs> right. Somebody's idea of making it interesting and scary and exciting. Um, doesn't mean that they didn't experience something in the house. Well, and, and when you look at the remake that they did with Ryan Reynolds, it, it goes even further, oh, you know, oh, <laughs> into oh, outer space, yeah. Brad, oh. you know. <laughs> I mean, I, right just nutsy wild over the top i mean and that was the movie honestly that george lutz i think finally i think it's what did him in I'm not kidding he had a heart attack um like the day they settled their lawsuit they had sued over that movie because they portrayed him as like an axe murderer with who had chopped up the family dog it's like i didn't do these things <laughs> like, you can't, right you can't portray me this way i'm a living person and there was lawsuits it was ugly it was horrible and i think the stress of that this is my opinion. I don't know this for a fact, but I think that was one of the contributing factors to his death at age 59. I think he was. Oh, wow. That's, that's young. I, yeah. I remember when he passed. Yeah. I, I didn't know how old he was though. Yeah. He was young, too young. And you know, a friend, I mean, somebody I really loved and cared for as a, you know, just as a person who, um, just brought happiness into my life and made me laugh. And I remember being at his house many times and, you know, playing dominoes and <laughs> stupid things. You know, he could just get everybody laughing and it was always a good time with him. Um, just somebody who, you know, it's a big loss for, for me personally. And I think for people who knew him well, but well, again, so you know, it's like, a, I go back to the early part of our conversation. People think they know someone, they know their motives, they know who they are, their character and, so many things have been said about him on the internet. They're just so ridiculous and so untrue. So you just have to kind of, I hate to say, but you have to learn how to suck it up. It's just the world we live in. And, you know, it's just, the internet is just a, you know, I hate to say most of the, most of the time it's just garbage. Well, yeah. And so please don't get offended. You know, when I, when I ask stuff about, about them, because it, it is mostly going oh, off God, of no, 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 videos no. and documentaries and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, the... no, listen. There were, he used to say to me all the time, he goes, I'd be, I'd be upset if he didn't ask me if it was true. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> he really welcomed the questions, you know, and, and the debate even sometimes. Um, but yeah, no, I don't find that offensive at all. I find it interesting. And I think I, maybe I'm doing him proud by just carrying on this conversation at all. Because I think, again, when I found him, he was so kind of off the grid from any of this stuff at that point, I think he was kind of like, why would anybody want to hear about the story? <laughs> he didn't even, he didn't quite even understand why that anybody would even want to watch a documentary like that after so many years. Like people even oh. know this exists. I don't know. I still do. So, I, I still watch yeah. when I find yeah, them no. on YouTube. I, I watch them new and yeah. old. So, yeah. cause I'm, I'm yeah, very curious, grown, you know, and then, yep. 
And then he, you know, I have to say after the documentary and, and all of that, he, he became more comfortable with it. He started doing, um, and I think there are, you probably find these on YouTube. Um, he did several talks at universities and various conventions, like kind of paranormal society conventions, um, where he really just, he did slideshows where he talked about, you know, here's, here's some photos from the house. This is what happened to us on this day. And, you know, he just was very candid and let people just come to the microphone and ask some questions. And he, he just, he liked that. He really, and he, and the other thing I think he really liked was meeting people who had experienced similar things in their homes or, you know, at some point in their lives that they couldn't explain. And I think they, he found like a kindred spirit, pardon the pun, uh, in those yeah. people who had, you know, had, had experienced the kind of the, the paranormal and that they had kind of run up against a lot of people who said, you're crazy. Yeah, because there, there so are, I think they, there's a lot yeah. of ideas, conspiracies out there. Like I'll, I'll mention two, one with, with mm -hmm. uh, uh, George and then one with DeFeo's is, um, I saw one documentary that basically said, and this is why I say don't be offended by what I'm saying, is I'm just going off the of stuff that I saw. No, no, no. I've heard um, it all. <laughs> I'm not offended. <laughs> is they moved into the house to mm -hmm. fake the the whole Amityville horror thing. So then mm -hmm. Ronnie DeFeo would stay off of death row when he talked about That's being hilarious. possessed. And and they somebody just, that they they never met, they lived miles and miles away had no knowledge in fact the realtor herself had to tell them what the house was by the time that they finished reviewing it so yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah and then the other one with uh with ronnie is that he had a uh um he had incest with his sister and that mm -hmm. she gave him the gun oh and that oh they God. were only supposed to shoot the parents but she shot the kids and he got really angry, and that's why she died the most violent. And they even give you kind of a, a hint of that in Amityville to the possession, where he basically well, has sex with her in the film. That that came from Amityville to the possession. There was never any talk about that they had an incestuous brother sister relationship. It was just another facet of a movie, underscore movie, dramatic film, not documentary, not podcast, not true crime fiction, whatever, or true crime, you know, whatever book. People just go nuts with this. Don DeVeo did not murder anyone. She was in her nightgown. Would you go around your house killing children in a nightgown? Would that be a good plan? <laughs> I don't think so. She's wearing a nightgown. Yeah. <laughs> there, was no, there was no sign of any struggle. True. She didn't fight over a gun. There was nothing out of place in the room. She was in her bed sleeping just like the rest of them. That is such, and I've heard it a million times. I'm not like hearing this for the first time. It's, just, it's so easily uh, refuted and proven to be complete you know, nonsense. It, just well, look at the crime scene photos. It's all right there. You don't have to, you don't have to be a, you're Sherlock Holmes to see that that's nonsense. And this poor girl, she was murdered in her bed and she's, being called a murderer because her brother couldn't take responsibility for what he did to all of his members of his family, including these innocent children. Right. He's the one that came up with this nonsense. And he married a woman who was a con artist and a dog abuser. And a, I mean, name it, this woman was a lunatic. And she went out on some tirade, you know, about how she knew the Lutzes and she knew this. And, and she was proven she wasn't, she wasn't even married to him at the time. She was married to some other man. She married him. She met him and married him while he was in prison, and they concocted this whole scheme to try to get him out, out on parole. So that's easily it's you can find all of this stuff. I mean, I guess there's ten or twelve or fifteen or maybe 150 of these websites. Out there. <laughs> they all have their own perspective on the Amityville case, but you know, all that stuff is so crazy to me. And um, all of these, again, I call them the the the, the ne'er do wells, the, the Johnny Come Lately's. They all come out after the fact, claiming to know something, because then they can associate their name with it and write their own book, make their own documentary, and again, try to milk this thing like it's some sort of cash cow. It, it kind of so, reminds me of strange. like, yeah, of like JFK and stuff, where there's like twenty different conspiracy right. theories and. 
you know, one even says yeah. that his wife had, you know, shot him in the head, which is why she's trying to get out of the car because she shot him and uh, then she was trying to escape. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's just, you so know, I mean, you much go down the that. rabbit hole with this. It's just rabbit hole stuff. It's conspiracy, crazy. Just put on your tinfoil hat at times. <laughs> That's the problem with things like Amityville is like it just sort of attracts an element. And I'm not saying like everybody who's interested in it. There's some super cool people, yourself. Um, so many people that have come and wanted to genuinely know about it, but there is this kind of like everything, there's this sort of dark kind of corner of it as well, where people want to provoke and they want to assume some kind of control or ownership of it. Okay. And the way they do it is by defaming other people and by making up crazy town stories like the two that you just told me. Um, and the fact that that's even out there is bothersome, but George lets, I just know what he would say. He goes, Oh, you know, people are going to say whatever they want to say. He gives a fuck. <laughs> He's just, right. He was that guy, you know, he just wasn't there to impress or try to convert anyone into thinking one thing or another. But he's like, you know, people are going to say what they're going to say. I know myself. I know my story. I know my family. I know what we experienced. Um, we didn't know the DeFeos. Never, you know, we'd heard of the murders, like everybody on Long Island. It was publicized. Um, but we didn't know when we went to look at that house that it was the, the house. Um, it wasn't until we fell in love with it that uh, Ms. Evans, who was the real estate agent, she said, I should probably tell you that this was, you know, the DeFeo home where that, where that took place. And they had to really debate whether they were going to want to live there as far as they were, <laughs> what they ever told me. And, and, you know, they sat down with the kids, explained the whole thing, and they just fell in love with the house and said, we'll just, we'll make this our own. Everything will be fine. Okay. Yeah. That makes Same sense. Classroom. So, <laughs> but that was, that was that. There was no grand conspiracy to like, get Ronnie <laughs> DeFeo another try. Again, that's all, you know, you have to understand, like, he was a mentally ill, uh, sociopathic, psychopathic killer, you know, who sat in prison for, in, you know, till the day he died a couple years back. Yeah. Um, and just as the years went on, you could kind of even see in his interviews, like he became even more detached from reality. And it was creepy to to sort of see what way he would turn the story next. I mean, at one point it was his mother did it, the mafia did it, the next door neighbor did it, the dog did it. Yeah, Don did it. <laughs> like I remember was, seeing an interview with him where he said that Don did it, and and he was framed. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's that's where that all comes from. That whole cockamamie thing you just told me about how she you know fought with a gun and she was uh, she was only supposed to kill the you know whatever the kids. Give me a she's. Who would go around with a high-powered hunting rifle in the middle of the night in a nightgown? <laughs> like, is that your master plan? Makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, but you well, know, if you you take it the next step, somebody would say, "Well, he dressed her in the nightgown afterwards." You know? <laughs> like you can't. The problem is with conspiracy theorists, you can't win. You can never actually get to the point where you're going to change their mind. So you just kind of go, "Okay, if they want to live well, in crazy land with them." She was normally dressed. She shot the kids, and then Ronnie said, okay. "No, you get in that bed with a gun on her. You get on. This is this is just me saying it. You get into the bed, uh -huh. but you got to get into your nightgown. Uh -huh. Get in there, uh -huh. and then he killed her. So she she was in street right. clothes, and then he threatened to kill her. Put the nightgown on, and then shot her. Does, how does does got that work? It. Makes it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I totally buy it." <laughs> Well, so I did watch the the, the documentary. I, I don't know if it's the whole thing, but I did find it on YouTube. And um, mm -hmm. so I, I think it was about 43 minutes. And then um, after... well, the whole thing, I think you missed the second part you missed, which was the cooler part for me. That was, oh. The first part was like a recap of everything. The second part, Horror Hoax, really brings in the whole debate of the whole story, um, whether it was true. you know. So I didn't shy away from the hard questions and <laughs> asking the lessons like, well, what about this? And what about that? And then, you know, and then again, bringing in all of these kind of, you know, characters that came along to say that it, they knew it was a hoax because of this. So the, the second part of the show, I think, is a little juicier. So if you have a chance oh. to see it. Um, yeah, yeah, I would like to it see it. It's even on, like, I think they put it on, this is going back a bunch of years, but I believe both parts of it are in one of the Amityville box set DVD releases. I think they called it Amityville Confidential. 
<gasps> so there, I have if that. You, maybe if you oh then there you'll have both of them oh i'll have to watch that when we're done here then because yeah because i remember watching yep. the documentary and george lutz was in it mm-hmm. kathy lutz was in it yeah it kind of yep. went through the defeos and the lutzes and there's a lot of interviews yep. with the lutzes and which i thought was pretty cool because right. i knew they were divorced and i'm like ooh, to get them in the same room together yep. that that must have been oh and and the only reason they did it was because it was the, the story. Like, otherwise, they would have no reason to <laughs> sit. You know, but the fact that they sat, and believe me, when I tell you, we shot that in Arizona in the summer in, like, 110 degree heat. It was the hottest room I've ever been in my life. But they sat <laughs> under those lights in, the, in this suffocating little conference room in a hotel for four or five hours. Oh, wow. Telling that story. And they just didn't skip a beat, you know? They just didn't. You know, if they if they had concocted some crazy town like like checking each other to make sure they told you know and they even had differences of opinions on certain things and you see it you know like no my my take on it was it was this you know so I think that that was interesting to me you know the fact that they sat side by side and you could also see Kathy was quite ill at the time she did that interview. yeah she had the the taint with her with the hoses in her nose and all that she had the she had the breathing yeah yeah so yeah. she had a she had a, a chronic condition, condition, uh, uh, respiratory disease called Valley fever, which was like where spores get into your lungs. Oh, it caused her a lot of pain. And I can tell you the la- what she did with her life was she, she drove, even in the condition she was in this woman that concocted this big hoax, supposedly spent her last years driving a van around bringing meals on wheels to, you know, sick and homeless people. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So that's that's awesome. How did she get rich off of Amityville Horror? I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, again, I just go back to the whole thing, like hoaxes and things like that. They're all the intention of that is to dupe the public and make as much money as you can. Well, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't get that. They didn't get the money. So to me, that was alone enough for me to think. Well, well wait a minute. So what was their motive? Why would they want to go public with this? Okay. All right. And I think okay. the answer that, that they always told me was the thing that they told me was there was so much. And again, remember, this is all long before Internet. This is in the 70s when, you know, things didn't travel at the speed of light the way they do now. But there's already enough of a kind of a snowball of, of fake stories and disinformation or whatever you want to call it. that was already kind of circulating and they wanted to get ahead of it. And that's why they said, we'll do the book. OK, but. How would they, unless they were psychics, I don't think they would have known that that would have become like a 10 time, you know, New York Times bestseller or whatever. <laughs> How many millions right. of copies that book sold? I just don't think they had that kind of media savvy to know this little, you know, newlywed couple from Long Island had any sense that this book was going to, you know, take off the way it did. It just was all of it, honestly, was I think a matter of timing for them, you know, like a not knowing. I think it was like the Exorcist was kind of in the, in the zeitgeist and, the omen and things like that. I think America was like wanting to see the devil around every corner. And the fact that there was this house with that history and the windows and like all of it was like the perfect storm for this thing to take off. But I don't think they, they, they didn't see it until it was too late. <laughs> they couldn't get off the ride. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So a lot of that makes sense. So the, well, again, you know, his his point of view was always, you know, I, I welcome the questions, I welcome the controversy. Even it keep for him, it was like, and one of the things he said to me often was, whatever people are saying, the fact that they're still talking about that house gave him some peace because he felt like it it reminds people that this kind of stuff can happen and that these stories do happen, and that for him, that was what his takeaway from it all, like like that there was a sense of um the conversation was a good thing okay yeah i would love to buy that house it's constantly going up for sale and i'd Uh, remodel it back back to the 70s and let people shoot there and do you know bed and breakfast and do all that stuff i love that. well the town would never let you do that they would (laughs) oh okay (laughs) they would would never oh no that's forbidden that's like, like in the deal when you buy that house you cannot turn it into any kind of commercial venture Oh, wow. Okay. Well, yeah, I could see that. I I remember seeing interviews where people were annoyed that tourists were coming by. They still are annoyed. Uh, (laughs) uh, um, You know, but here's the thing. I think, you know, 
the other reason people say it was a hoax was because oh, none of the other re- the owners have reported any you know ghosts or whatever. But how do I don't think we know how hauntings work. I don't think we know the way that works. There's no rule book. Um, the Lutzes actually claim that whatever it was was in the house, you know, tormented them for many years after the fact. And it wasn't until they met the Archbishop from Canterbury who performed a rite of exorcism on the family that they felt like they were free of it. But the things were going on in their lives for years after the fact. So maybe whatever it was there latched onto them. But I will tell you this, there were a few people we interviewed for that show, which is interesting. One in particular comes to mind, this man who lived up the street and it was totally like an uninvited thing. He was like watering his lawn and there we were like shooting B roll <laughs> for <this> documentary. <laughs> oh, are you guys making a show about the house? That's you know, everybody kind of figures that's what we're doing there. And he was really friendly. He came over and turned the hose off and came to say hello. And he's like, yeah, he goes, I've lived here since the DeFeos were here. I grew up in this town, in this neighborhood. And um, he told us some Ronnie DeFeo stories, how he, I remember he said that he had tried to run over his girlfriend's dog at one oh. point. So he was no. like a terror in the neighborhood. That was one story I remember he told us. The other story he told us that he didn't want to say on camera. And he goes, you know, there are other people here who would, who would share similar stories. We don't want this getting out, but there's something in that house. We all know it because I was in that house after the whole thing had blown up, the like two owners down the road or whatever, after the Lutzes has fled. And they invited me to a party. It might've been even a Halloween party. It's like, I went up to the third floor to, to change or use the restroom or something. And he's like, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the shadow like dart by in the hallway and there was nobody there. And he's like, I'm telling you, it was a human form. I saw it. It looked at me. I looked at it and it was just not there again. Hmm. So he goes, I, I know there's something to the house and other people in this neighborhood will say that to amongst ourselves, but we will never say that publicly. Huh? Well, okay. So, so I mean, that's, talking... my, that's my final word on Amityville. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Well, then, okay, so we got the videos, we got the movies, you you got somebody who was mm-hmm. watering their lawn talking to you and all that. How do you yep. then take all this information and put it into the Amityville murders? Oh, your movie. Good. Oh, I, didn't see that. I didn't see that question coming. Um, good, good <laughs> question. You know, um, I, it had been something that had been talked about for a while. I had produced another movie. It was pretty well known and did well called the haunting in Connecticut. And Good film. thank you. Um, that took a while to get made again, based on a true story. Allegedly, you know, again, you can go online and read all kinds of, you know, whatever counterpoints to that. But, you know, as far as I knew and having met the family and you know, they, they experienced something that scared the shit out of them. Anyway, so the haunting in Connecticut came out and there was kind of an interest for a while in, you know, you, you know, you do something that's even modestly successful and people want you to do more of that. And so I happened to be in a meeting. This is two years down, you know, after the, the fact, it's probably even five years later. And I just happened to be in a meeting with a, with a, 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 a production company distributor. Um, and they were like, oh, you know, Haunting In was a successful movie. What other true hauntings could we turn into films? And I said, well, you know, they've done, and I even mentioned Amityville. I said, well, the one that really hasn't been done is the story of, you know, the, the family that lived there. And I mentioned, of course, Amityville 2, which was very loosely, you yeah. know, kind of inspired by the, the Fayo case. And I said, you know, there was some, just some really strange elements to the story that have never been told. And I, and I was interested in the point of view of like, was Butch DeFeo possessed? Was he um, on drugs? Was he a sociopath he was he was was he this abused kid like there are all of those perspectives that i was like oh that's so interesting um and so it was out of that conversation that that movie came to be and it all happened fast at that point it was with you know within six months i think that movie was done after that initial meeting so it was kind of something percolating in my mind for a while like how you could do it um, and then they told me what the budget was going to be. I'm like, you guys are crazy. You know? <laughs> so, but, you know, we're like, okay, let's, let's try, you know, and we were lucky to find a house in Los Angeles that um, at least had the bones of the interior of the house were pretty, pretty spot on. Um, and the rest of it was just all done very quick. Um, and it had to be contained, you know, it was such a small budget. We couldn't do a bunch of like, 
you know, company moves around town and, and, you know, making it a, a big scope, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't go to, you know, we couldn't recreate Long Island in the seventies. In other words, um, it had to be the house. It had to be that family. It had to be self-contained, small cast. Um, and that's, that's where it was born. It was out of that. And when you, so knowing all the information that, you know, and then writing the script mm-hmm. for it, because you're the writer director of it. How do you take kind of fact from fiction and get that into the film? Because like Oliver Stone has said, and I'll go back to JFK. He goes, oh, yeah, I took two Uh conspiracy theories, put them together, and then I had to make up stuff (laughs) to kind of fit it all together. So you're like, yeah, I mean, that's 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 movies, you know, (laughs) and I've done other movies, you know, we can get into you know, like we did The Haunting of Sharon Tate. And we did that's coming up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. And, and, you know, again, people want to say things about that movie. You don't know where my heart was when I made that movie. Nobody does. And and you can watch that movie and see whatever you want to see. I and mean, I'm not going to explain much of it to you or you or anybody. It's I know exactly what the movie's about and what it's saying. It has nothing to do with exploitation. That's all I will say. Um, that being said, um, you know, with the Amityville murders, yeah, it was, it was a little bit of that. It was kind of taking all of the theories, you know, of, of the, the story and kind of how it went down. Um, and kind of wending that into a narrative that would fit a, a film structure, you know? So it's like establishing this family and their relationships and how dysfunctional it all was. And, and the fact that he did have a connection to his sister, you know, that they were the older of the, of the siblings and they kind of maybe looked out for each other. You, you have to only imagine what it could have been because sadly the people aren't here to talk about it, number one. Right. But number two, you know, you are telling a dramatic reinterpretation. You're not telling, this wasn't a documentary. It wasn't attempting to be a documentary. Um, so, you know, you, you, you take some of the established facts of, of what we know happened, the sort of the relationships of the family. One scene in particular that comes to mind is where he tries to shoot the father in the head. Um, he's beating on the sister and the mom and the whole thing. And it's like this family, you know, upheaval, this horrible, abuse going on in the house and 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 butch comes into the kitchen and aims the the rifle at his dad's head and 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 it's loaded and but it doesn't go off and that was true allegedly i mean that's that's one of the stories that was told that that that, that he tried to kill the dad um yeah and that that didn't go off and and the father thought it was some kind of miracle like oh you know god delivered me and that's when the family brought all that kind of religious stuff into the house, you know, like the statues that were all over the lawn and all of that, that was supposedly a direct result of that incident. So, you know, it was kind of peppering those things in with the idea that, you know, I don't ever, you know, it's, it's, it definitely shows a supernatural angle, but really when you look at it, if you kind of step back from a movie, it's like, is this all in his head? Is he just seeing this stuff because he's Mm. on drugs or he's maybe possessed by something? You know, I think if you, if you, look back in the movie like take the 30,000 mile view of the movie there's a lot of moments in the movie where you're kind of like oh wait a minute <laughs> like, I just want to kind of play with the audience a little bit because we don't know you know so I think the idea that everybody knows the house is haunted like okay there what if that what if he's just addicted to all of these drugs which he we know he was um how did that come into play so it was you know like I said it was sort of taking all those disparate elements and then trying to find some narrative structure to tell it but also tell it in a very um compartmentalized way you know we couldn't make it too big yeah, and then the I, other cool thing was we got diane franklin, diane franklin from amityville too so, such a and burt ward star. and burt and, yeah and burt, burt young burt young oh burt young i'm sorry burt ward is robin from yeah. batman yeah that's not robin burt young yeah yeah uh, <laughs> no, burt young was great um and diane was just such a joy to have and and just brought so much you know fun and um sensitivity to the thing um she was a sweetheart yeah, I really like that you've had both of them back in it. I'm I'm just like, oh, this guy knows Amityville. You know, we're going a <laughs> going a little bit back to Amityville to the possession here. I think I thought that was really cool. I mean, it could have been like stunt casting in a way, but I, you know, it's funny when I called Diane about this project. It was actually through her her manager at the time, this guy Scott uh, Ray, who contacted her for me, and she called me, and you know, I think she was kind of like, who are you? Uh, what are you doing? And <laughs> 
she, you know, I kind of told her I wrote the part with her in mind and she was so over the moon excited, but she also wanted to earn it. She's like, no, no, don't just give it to me. Like, I want to come in and like read it for you and, and in front of the casting directors. I want to, I want to earn it. And so she did and she came in and we'd seen a lot of different actresses for the part and some really good ones. But Diane came in and she just kind of blew us all away. Uh, she was so good and so earnest. And so it was like done, <laughs> of course. Nice. So, but it was, yeah. So that was, that was, that was a great honor and pleasure again to work with her and, and just get to know her personally. Such a sweet woman and um, just yeah, she, great stories to tell in her early career too. Yeah. She, she's very innocent in like Amityville to the possession. And then she's mm -hmm. just like, yeah, like yeah. a sweet, caring mom in, in the Amityville murders. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, yeah, it's great yeah. seeing her. Feel and, for her you know? It yeah. has that kind of something about the eyes or the inflection in her voice. I don't know what it is about her, but there's something so endearing about her. Um, you know, she was, you know, a bit of it's weird. Like they sold her as kind of like this sexy, you know, kind of teenager back in the movie. She did like Last American Virgin and things like that. And, yeah. Which I know she got a lot of hatred for because she ended up with the bad guy at the end of the movie. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she did. Um, but I, I still like that movie a lot. Yeah. So good, yeah. I mean, what a great soundtrack. Imagine they couldn't. I mean, today that soundtrack would have cost them millions more than the movie would have cost to make. If they I had have that soundtrack. Songs. In those yeah. days, you could just use so use songs back in those days for nothing. Uh, that's why I don't fear the reapers in Halloween. They didn't have to. I mean, they paid, but it wasn't like today. It's like thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a track. Jeez, and more. Yeah, expensive, but. Um, but yeah, so all of those things just combined. It was a great ensemble. We all had a good time. We shot the thing in like 15 days, I think it was, and in the summertime. And um, it was just a fun experience, you know, and, and just something that I could kind of get behind. Because I was like, yeah, you know, nobody knows this better than me, so they say. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's true. Do this. And yeah, it went, it went well and um, everybody was happy. So with the Amityville murders, did that then kind of, they're like, oh, we need to get him for Amityville, the awakening. Oh no. Amityville, the awakening happened before that. That's actually was made in 2014. I want to say. Oh, that's right. It took a few it's years for it to come out. Yes. Yeah. It was the notorious, like last hurrah of dimension films. Um, that it, in fact, we had developed that project in something like 2011. And it was going to be a completely different movie. It was supposed to be a project Jason Blum, who obviously we all know who he is. And he, you know, I sold that to Jason on the pitch that we had all of these lost home movies from the Amityville house. Like the, the Lutzes had given me their home movies and that all of this paranormal stuff went on and it was all on film. It's all in Super 8 film from the time. Hmm. And he's like riveted, and I'm telling him this story, and, I, and he goes, "Oh my god, I have to see these films. Can I? Can I see the films?" And I said, "Well, we have to go make them." <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, you got me, you got me!" Like this is like the guy who brought us Paranormal Activity at that moment, uh, and he was thrilled. He's like, "Oh, we could take the Paranormal Activity model and put it on Amityville Horror." I said, "That's the idea," and that's what we sold him. And then that mutated into, you know thousands of different you know iterations it seemed and directors and writers and all kinds of people getting involved and ultimately they settled on Amityville the Awakening which I didn't love um but yeah but that's the weird thing about that movie was they made it they spent several million dollars to make it and it just sat on a shelf until it just you know the studio imploded and I think they put it on Google Play for free <laughs> I think the movie wow. made eight dollars Oh wow! I I own it. I I liked it. I, I liked oh, the meta part of it. I thought it was great that mm -hmm. you know that that you know uh, Bella Thorne's character has no idea what the Amityville horror is because I'm guessing if you're not into that stuff, you right. probably wouldn't know it. And then the guy goes, "Oh yeah, right. well here's here's the DVDs, you know, of yeah. <laughs> the first three yep. movies, you know. So it did yep. happen, but these are the movie versions." And I'm like, I love this. Yep. I love that it's kind of in this because, you know, I don't know any of the other versions. I only know the version that I saw and, and what I saw, I enjoyed right. and waited years yep. for it. 
and and bought mm-hmm. it immediately when it came out on Blu-ray and and was you know oh, well, I'm thank glad you that for I the, liked it you know so. the three cents that the studio made back on that but no thank you <laughs> so the cool thing was they had some they had some money behind it you know it was a studio movie and they had a little you know it wasn't a big budget movie but it had enough money they could go out and they rebuilt the you know facade of the house from the, the original film and and it just looked cool you know it was like to be on that set and sort of see the house in front of you I remember they they built it in a park in Long Beach. California and uh, the joggers who would just like jog in that park every day. They they saw this house being erected and then they realized what the house was. <laughs> they started jogging in the other direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go this way. <laughs> yeah, let's maybe we stay away from that one. But yeah, yeah. Was, that was fun. But you know, it was a great cast. It was Jennifer Jason Lee and actually uh, I think it's Thomas Mann and he was in Halloween Kills. I think he was the officer who um, is it Hawkins? They call him Officer Hawkins who. Um, has to kill his he kills his partner accidentally at the beginning of the movie in the flashback. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, he was the he was the kid you were referring to who had the Amityville DVD in his backpack. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah, put the two together. Actor. So yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, well, he I liked a bit it, younger. So. Yeah, yeah, it was so, cool. Yeah, I mean, listen, there were good things about it. I just think it was such a long road in development and finally to production, and then to have it sort of like you know kind of rotting away on a you know vault shelf for all those couple two or three years i think at least and they kept announcing yeah. release dates so i think even, like even the you know the fickle internet was like what the hell you know so um it was i guess it's cool that it finally came out but there's also a different version of that movie speaking of studio interference there was a, a much harder like r-rated version of it that was much more violent um that didn't get released i don't think it's ever been released so it's oh, kind of man. like the producer's cut version um of amityville the awakening so we, we need somewhere. that I don't know, maybe, right maybe we'll get shout factory i'll do that eventually yeah hey hey i'm i'm buddies with cliff over there i'm i've done it for 30 years oh, over good. at shout factory so oh nice nice, nice. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so, he, you know you get it I mean, he gets the stuff and that he's he was really the champion i think of all things halloween six and <laughs> putting that out in the proper form and at least the producers cut and getting all those elements together for us. So that was really cool. Yeah, he he's really good at that. I mean, he's one of the founders yep. of, of Scream Factory, not Scream Shout yep. or, no, or Shout don't. Factory, but yep. Scream Factory. So yeah, Absolutely. yeah I've known yeah, him for sure is. we we used to uh work at a movie theater together. He was my manager and I was his oh, theater usher up to assistant manager at one point. Oh, wow, so, wow. Taking it yeah. way that boy, he's he's come a long way. Good for you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, it's a it was actually a, a journey that made sense for to where he's at right now. So it was it was it's fun. So and, and he's still doing it. So. Very cool. Yeah. Um it's really think, cool. Yeah, I love hearing stories like that. But yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, those that's kind of, those are kind of my adventures in Amityville. I don't know much more I can how much more I can share. <clears throat> well, I'll mention and then we'll move on to the other stuff. Um, I did sure. notice in the Amityville murders. I've worked with two of your actors. Oh, really? Which ones? So I worked with Sarah French, who is Dawn's friend oh, I in the credits. Her. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, I worked with her on Art of the Dead, which was a Mahal Brothers film. Nice. And um, okay. in the party scene, um, Peter Stickles, mm-hmm. who I've worked with a few He's times. He's one now. of my oldest oldest LA buddies yeah well actually I knew him when he, he lived in New York City so uh you know Peter's great and he just he literally did it as, for fun you know I was like hey we need people in this party scene he's like I'll be right there <laughs> as Peter would do so he came running down and, and helped us out in a pinch we were just trying to bring you know bodies into the, the scene and and he was just kind enough to do it and and my friend Jared also did it Jared Rivet who's also a writer director good friend of mine um, so there's some some familiar genre faces in that party scene if you look closely, uh, but Peter's great and I love Sarah. She again she did that as she was she came over with Steve Barton of Dread Central fame and um, we just kind of threw her in the movie <laughs> like Sarah. Want to be in it? <laughs> she's like yes. Yeah. Anyway, so she's yeah. Favorite. I thought I always kind of look through the credits to see if I recognize people and and it's uh, nice. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, oh, that's Sarah French. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, there's Peter. Well, again, you know, when you're making a movie that quickly and on a, such a you know minuscule budget, you you call a friend. So that's the you know that's that's you that's where you, you call in your favors of your friends. So it was all of that, you know. So that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah, and and from my and I'll say this, and then we'll we'll go on to. Um, the haunting of Sharon Tate is 
it's interesting because when I talk to you and I go, oh, I like that movie. I own it on Blu-ray. Uh-huh. And you say, thank you. You, of course, have a completely different thought on it because you were there yeah, um, or you directed it right. or you wrote it or produced it. And you know that mm-hmm. the 10 different versions that it's gone through. And I only know what I'm seeing on Blu-ray. So, uh-huh. you, you know, it, it's always interesting talking to people because I did a, my my first feature is Meat Hook Massacre 4 and I was hired oh. on to do it and mm-hmm. I don't like the movie but people message me going okay. they did like the movie they're like oh right, it's the right, best right. in the series there's like 10 of them made now they're like oh it's still right. the best one and I'm like well thank See? you but I don't have a lot of kind things to say about it <laughs> oh that's funny well yeah I mean that's the thing is you know you 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 write something or you you know whatever you you know what your intention was or what you sort of had in your head I think Halloween 6 would probably be the closest thing I would like in your experience too, in the sense of it, like, okay, I know what the movie was in my brain. I just don't recognize any of that on the screen. So, <laughs> um, uh, but no, I, I totally understand that. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing, you know, how I, how it, how ideas mutate or they, you know, and there's sometimes there's a committee of people you have to go through to finally get somewhere. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's always, you know, it's a juggling act, I think. And you have to be very diplomatic in, in film. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot out of you. <laughs> you love it, doing it, but it uh, takes a yeah, lot out I, of you. Well, yeah, I just, you know, the, the, and the, I, I could definitely feel my age when I come home from a 12 day or 12 hour shoot. And I, you know, I literally can't move my feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel it. I definitely feel the difference. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I saw on, um, I was watching a video on YouTube and they call this your trilogy. So tell me if I'm wrong, which would be Amityville Murders, I mean, The Haunting of Sharon okay. Tate, and The Murder of uh, mm-hmm. Nicole Brown Simpson. Because they're, so I uh, guess that not a trilogy, no, they are a trilogy? I mean, never, never intended to be a trilogy. Um, the Sharon Tate project was kind of, it was on the set of Amityville Murders, same producers. Um, and they felt like, maybe I felt more like, but there was a sense of like, I kind of owed them something, you know, they got this movie made very quickly. They got me to direct it. They got me to write the thing. They didn't really mess with it too much. And they were kind of like, we need to do something else right away. And here's what we'd like to do. And my initial reaction was you are insane (laughs) to touch that. (laughs) Um, I don't think I can wrap my brain around this one. But they're like, you know, and again, you're in the middle of a production day and things are crazy and you're just trying to make your days. And But weirdly enough, after it was done, after the movie was done, they came to me again and said, you know, we'd like to do this and we have, you know, the money to do it and we want to, we want you to do it. We, and I said, I don't think I can do this. It just sounds too distasteful, which is what the movie ended up being called. Um, but, but then I went away and I thought about it. It wasn't for very long, maybe a week or two. And I thought of this notion of a dream within a dream and the idea of fate, which probably came out of, you know, my love of all things Halloween. And also the fact that all the people who sadly and horrifically died in that massacre, not much was really known about them. We all had heard about Sharon Tate and the fact she was pregnant. It was just unfucking thinkable what happened to her. Oh yeah. But then there were these other people, her friends that lived in and like who were these people? I I had no idea even their names. And I think the other thing that when I started to research it, the thing that hit me and it hit me the wrong way, and maybe this is again going to my kind of like knee jerk thing, you know, reaction to all things that you see on the internet is the sort of fan base that Charles Manson had acquired over the years. And Crazy. I mean fan base t-shirts, love letters. Like, I'm like, this is fucking sick. Does, does anybody remember how horrible that was? Do these people have any idea what these people went through? No. And I thought to myself, no, they don't. And then I thought to myself, well, wouldn't it be amazing if by some twist of fate, literally, that Sharon Tate was able to turn the tables and her friends were able to turn the tables on their murderers 
And I thought of this idea of kind of alternate universes, like, 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 like sliding doors, like that movie and, and things where you can kind of step in and out of different realities. I mean, obviously now everything everywhere, that's like <laughs> become mainstream now. Um, but it was, it was that sort of very simple notion of like, what, what, wouldn't it have been amazing if, if it hadn't turned out that way? And could you give power back to these victims and, 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 and give these people who attacked them and violently murdered them exactly what they fucking deserved? Little did I know at the time, Quentin Tarantino had the exact same idea. <laughs> <laughs> no idea what he was making. I had no idea. All I knew about his movie was that where we ended up shooting that film in the Hollywood Hills, which was actually owned, this house was owned by the Randall Kleiser who had directed Grease and the Blue Lagoon and all, you know, famous director, Randall Kleiser, his yeah. house. Oh, okay. And we, we made a deal with him to shoot our movie there. And he th- called us like a week later. He goes, you're not going to believe this. But Quentin Tarantino's location manager just came here wanting to shoot their movie here. Oh. But I told them that they couldn't because where you're going to make your movie here. <laughs> oh, well, that was yeah, <laughs> So good. I kind of beat him to the chase by a week. <laughs> But little wow. did I know, like it was the same, the same twist. Like he had the same idea in mind, except in his version, it was like Sharon's neighbors were going to, you know, beat the shit out of these people or blast them into a pool. Um, and that's kind of where it began. But um, yeah, he got an Oscar nomination and I got death threats <laughs> for making the same thing. Well, yeah, because so, which is why I when I contacted you, that's why I said, you know, well, give me some time. I want to watch some stuff, and I ended up watching yeah, yeah. a lot of these movies either for the first time or again, okay. and then watched a mm-hmm. whole bunch of reviews and stuff on on YouTube. Oh god! Just, and I'm like, can't. just don't, man. Don't this film is just getting destroyed, yeah. and I liked mm-hmm. it, and I don't know why these mm-hmm. people have what's. Now I'm not comparing your film because to a lifetime movie, something. but. Everybody it, got on the train of you're supposed to hate it, so let me hate it even more than the next guy. They most of these people didn't even watch it because they didn't even know how it end how it ended or or what the twist was. They didn't get to that part, but, or they never watched it. And if they did, they just wanted to bitch and moan about it anyway. How dare you? How this? How that? And it's like you didn't watch it, and you don't know who I am. So so get off your high horse. Um, but yeah, that's what the that's the problem. That's the internet. They yeah, all ha- were told that you're supposed to hate it, so let's go hate it. Yeah, because it, yeah, I mean, but listen, that's actually Jeff, not the. Was, that's not the ahead. final oh, twist, sorry. right? That there, there's actually a little something beyond that. That of them, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, mm-hmm. fighting the Manson people, and and because uh, right. I am, this right. is going to sound weird. I'm, I know a lot of history of Charles Manson, so I'm not a fan, but mm-hmm. I'm very interested in that time right. period. So I don't want to say I'm a Manson fan because I'm not. But it, it's, right. um, I thought that where you took it, where, which, you know, yeah, where they're fighting them and defending each other. And then there's, which was a mm-hmm. twist in its own. And then right. there's that little bit at the end where yeah. it wasn't really a twist. Mm-hmm. It, so. Mm-hmm. Which makes it different yeah. from Tarantino's. Yeah, the whole thing is crap. It wasn't, listen, that movie wasn't meant to entertain people. It just it wasn't. I wasn't doing it twirling my mustache and going, oh, I'm going to get them, you know. Oh, you know, I'm going to offend people. I'm going to make them so angry. Like, no. I wanted to remind people how brutal, horrible, heartless, and evil that night was and what happened in the house was. But I also wanted to, I didn't want to leave them with that. I wanted to leave them with, a sense of optimism is way too strong of a word, but a kind of like a ray of hope in that, you know, they call it that tunnel you go through at the end of your life, you know, if you believe in such things. And I thought to myself, if you are, if your life is robbed from you so quickly and so violently and so wickedly as what happened to these people and many others, I'm not saying this is, yeah, I'm just focusing on this story. Would you know that you were dead? That's that was the question. Would you would you know? And if okay. you had to, and if you weren't sure, and you were all kind of in this nether world together, which was what the movie was, and you had to relive it and kind of come to terms with what had happened to you, could you have done it differently? Would you have played those events out differently? And that's really what the movie was kind of 
in a basic way about. Um, but I think, again, it's the knee-jerk reaction. The fact that Sharon Tate's sister went out of her way to blast the movie without having seen it. I also emailed her in, during the process of making it, and she'd never responded, and I completely understood. You know, and I, and I sent her a very, what I thought was like a heartfelt message, personal message, and talking about my intentions and where I was coming from with this and, and telling her I understood that, you know, if she never wanted to see it or if she was angry about it, I get it 100%. Um, but this was my way of kind of acknowledging the past, but also empowering those victims in some small, minuscule way. She never responded and I got it. But the thing that really unnerved me <laughs> was when I found out she sold that email to TMZ. Oh. And they published it. Look at this sack of shit who made this sack of shit movie being a sack of shit in what he wrote to her. Like that's, that's what she did. Oh, wow. Instead of just saying, in any way reaching out and saying, I hate you or, hey, let's have a <laughs> conversation. She just took the money and sold it to TMZ. And that's sad. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have no idea about that. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And that just fire fanned the flames even more. So I think it was after that that you started to see all those nasty, you know, YouTube reviews and how dare you and you, you the victims and all of this kind of faux outrage that, you know, people and they're still playing that card, you know, with the, the Dahmer series that came out. And, you know, you can't you kind of can't do anything unless it's a podcast, apparently anymore. Um, like dramatic interpretation is off the table. Um, but again, I, I know exactly where I was coming from. I know where exactly where the cast was coming from. Lydia Hurst was in that film and she's the daughter of Patty Hurst, which was, who was a completely controversial, you know, person, uh, who had withstood her horrors that we can't even imagine in the seventies, uh, yeah. and, and was brain by a cult essentially and forced to do crazy things like Rob Banks and you know, Lydia Hurst took part in this project because she, she read the script and she goes, I understand what you're saying. I know what this is. I'll do this yeah. movie. Yeah, I looked her up. I'm so, like, Hearst, that's yeah. really, is she Is yeah, she an actual right. Hearst? And I looked her up, I'm like, well, wow, she's a Hearst. <laughs> yeah, she's Patty's daughter. Um, and, you know, I thought, again, like all, all, all of us, I felt like we're bringing such like care and sensitivity to what we were doing every day, you know, and it was a quick, it was like, we made that in 12 days. It's amazing to me the backlash that a movie that was made for five cents <laughs> could engender. Um, when, you know, again, like movies like Quentin's movie did the same thing. It did the same thing. It turned the tables on these would-be murderers. I think the difference was it didn't, it didn't depict the way it happened. You know what I mean? Like we actually showed what happened to these poor people that night. Um, and doing nothing but just living their lives and, and having dinner or, or, you know, hanging out with friends in the living room. Like that's all they were guilty of. It's yeah, just, you know, you have this lunatic, you know, fucking master race planning, <laughs> drug addled oh, yeah. cult leader living in the hills of Chatsworth saying, let's go make something nice and witchy and go kill a bunch of rich people. And then we'll start a race war. You know, it just, it's so sick and demented and, and everything. And then you think about the fact she was eight months pregnant. Um, it's just so unnerving and so chilling to me. So for anybody who thinks that, you know, I made that movie out of some sort of heartless, like, inability to you know portray these people as human beings like you don't know me at all and in fact i think there's a lot of humanity in in the way we portrayed these characters they were young and kind of you know doing things that kids did in the 60s and and on a path to success each and every one of them um it was just a, an incredible human tragedy to me that whole story every oh. every moment of it and it, to oh, me, it wasn't is. a movie meant to entertain it wasn't meant to entertain and and I remember days where movies were made that weren't entertaining, but were considered maybe thought provoking or um, at least had some core morality to them. But to be accused of all of this immoral stuff, I, I was gobsmacked um, and scared, mm. frankly, because the death threats oh. that came after that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's. So, because I yeah. do remember like Tarantino did have his issues. Like I re th this wasn't like for the, for the subject of, of his film, but there was mm -hmm. the woman who yeah. sat there and said like, why didn't Robo Margie have more lines? 
So he's she was right, trying right. to attack him for like, a, why doesn't a woman have more mm-hmm. lines? And then um, a right. friend of mine who is Asian, and uh, I asked him, "Did have you seen the film?" Oh, and he goes, yeah. "No, I won't That's see it." Yeah. And I'm like, "Why?" And he goes, right. "Because of what they did to Bruce Lee." And I'm like, "But there's a reason why they did oh. that. Is if Brad Pitt's character can beat up Bruce Lee, he could take on the Manson family." The Manson Manson cult, yeah. No, I mean, all of that is all valid. And I think, and actually, it, it helped me a little bit down the road after having read some of the, you know, again, I mean, Quentin's movie was, <laughs> I think I think our craft service budget, I mean, I think their craft <laughs> service budget was the budget of our entire film. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but that being said, he did some, you know, he's good and he's outspoken and he defends the stuff, rightly or wrongly, he, he just does. I tend to take more of a back seat and kind of cower. But um, he, you know, had some stuff like, you know, I get it. If you're the if you're the daughter of Bruce Lee or the sister of Sharon Tate, I get your issue. I get it. Everybody else can suck my dick. So I'll just <laughs> I'll use that quote and then I'll end this part of the conversation with that. OK, so now uh, what about uh, <laughs> the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson? What about that one? How'd that come Another out? movie that this was one where the script that we were going to do was very different. And they wanted to attach all of this kind of violent content to it. And I objected to it. And that was added later. And if I, I my choice was to remove my name from the movie because I knew this was going to oh. cause even more of a stir. And contractually, I couldn't do it. And it was a whole thing. And so the less said, the better. Oh, on that film. We're, we're done with that? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Nothing to say. Okay. All right. Fair. <laughs> because okay. It's, it's exactly what I didn't want it to be or for it to engender among people. You know, we were just, you know, there were already kind of like, you know, from the, from the Sharon Tate movie and, and even Amityville Murders, you know, kind of got a little bit, people got ruffled over it. And I said, I just don't want to associate with this. And I owed them another project contractually, these people. And so I did it. Um, wasn't my idea. Neither of those two movies, by the way, were my idea. Um, the first one, I felt like I really owed them. The second one, I kind of contractually owed them. Um, but I vehemently disagreed with the approach. Okay. And uh, they did what they wanted to do with it. So, you know, it's what it is. Well, I will say with the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson is it did get me thinking because I am a staunch OJ did it. And then I had this oh, the absolutely. second time watching it. I am too. Yeah, and then I right. went, well, is there, who is? Yeah, no, go yeah, ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I was saying, question. sorry. You know, who is this guy? You know, who is this, mm-hmm. you know, this Glenn Rogers? And I'm like, and I'm pretty big on yep. serial killers. I'm like, I don't, I haven't heard of this guy before. And I looked right. him up and there's a whole documentary about the guy called My Brother the Serial Killer. And OJ's yep. mentioned, Nicole Brown Simpson's mentioned, and that he was a suspect. Yep. And I'm like, whoa. Yep. Maybe this yep. has something to say. So I know you don't like it, but it actually made me do research and kind of think a little differently. Uh, <laughs> well, here's the thing. I am exactly where you're coming from. I mean, just from my own personal, if you want to call it political point of view or whatever, my, my, my view is exactly like what everybody else is. He's guilty as fuck. You know, OJ did it. There's no question about that. I also think the movie is a little, it's funny. I think there's some reviews or some, you know, internet, you know, guys living in their basement or whatever, saying, oh, it tries to exonerate OJ. Well, if you look at the movie closely, it doesn't. It never shows who's doing the killing, you know? And there's this weird confluence of people coming together. It's like, it's there's Glenn Rogers on one side, there's OJ's abusive stalking on the other side. There's, you know, all of these kind of pieces of her life that are kind of colliding. And I thought that was an interesting premise. But I never for a minute thought, oh, like, let's movie, make a movie that says O.J. wasn't that killer. <laughs> I just thought what was interesting to me about the original conceit was what just what you said. It's like, is it possible she actually knew this guy? How bizarre is that? Like, what a weird turn of events that kind of never you never really heard about, like you said. And so I did, like, the same thing that you did. I kind of dug into it a little bit. And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. As long as we don't take it to this point where we show them getting cut up, I'm good. Well, that's exactly what they ended up wanting to do, showing them get cut up. Well, and, and that's and, why I was like, oh, this is yeah, ridiculous. They and, and all, and I actually want to make a comment about that ending because it's uh, they 
you don't say that OJ ever does it. It does kind of like right. he says Charlie. And in interviews yep. with OJ, he does mention Charlie. And in that documentary, yep. Charlie is mentioned. And right. did OJ hire him to do it? Was OJ with him when right. he did it? Was he, right. you know, did OJ do it? So there's all, once again, there are questions. All but let's these, put it this way. We know that we know OJ was a part of it. <laughs> That's a given. Yeah. I think this movie just sort of poses a question, and I'm trying to take the, uh, you know, the, the high road if I can on this. Is the, the idea of the movie was to put the question in people's minds of like, do we know the whole story here? Not to exonerate him, but to sort of say, could there have been other factors? Could there have been this guy? Like, right. it was a, more of a what if movie than anything else. And to me, that was interesting. I think fiction based on fact is always interesting. But I think the difficulty is when you're dealing with the fact that these were like violent murders and somebody lost their mom and these children. And I mean, it was just horrifying. It's the same reaction I had to the Sharon Tate thing, but for me, the Sharon Tate one was more, I don't know, it just felt more, I hit the word, I hit the word empowering, but almost like that sense of justice in a way, you know, like this is what should have happened that night. They should have been able to defend themselves and they should, and like, and somebody even said, oh, you, you're shaming those victims. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> They're fighting back. And they're like, well, no, you're saying that if, because they were too stupid to fight back in real life. Like, no, like anybody who would think that has got screws loose. Yeah. And you have two good actresses in there too, playing the leads. Yeah, they were, they were. So, and, and, and Hillary was amazing. Nina was a sweetheart and um, just, you know, I'm grateful to both of them and I'm sorry that they took so many lumps over it, but we all did. And, you know, and I, um, I just don't know that, it's just not a, it's not a safe place to tell stories based on, you know, things that I think trigger people. It, 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 we just live in a world where people have too much power behind their keyboard. It's not safe. Oh, yeah. No, I would definitely agree with that. And uh, basically, you know, my, my questioning stuff comes from a movie and it comes from a, a documentary. So now, like the mm -hmm. brother of, of Glenn Rogers says, oh, yeah, OJ hired him to go get, I think he said, earrings that were like a few yeah. thousand dollars. And you may right. have I to, read that. Yep. yeah, you may have to kill the bitch is, is what was in the documentary. Yes. And, and so it's that. like, yeah. huh, may, okay. So, yeah, I mean, right. so I don't, now I brought up the ending is I actually expected it to be a bloodbath. And I was surprised oh, when it okay. wasn't. I was thinking, wait well, a minute. It might have had some of my influence of like, please, for the love of God, don't don't show the murders. You know, like that was like my one thing. Like, 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 please let, don't make us like make this movie about that. Because um, it's just horrible enough as it is. But then they're like, no, 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 you have to have that. And I just, I think maybe it was cut back on because of my objections. You know, I feel like maybe there was some maybe they rushed it more. <laughs> I don't know. If, if I had any influence, it was probably in that, just my objection to the, the, the finale of the thing. I just, I felt like if you just, if they were found there that way and we just have never, we, we all know what happened. We don't need to see it. Um, and that was yeah, the, the figure comes up behind them, cut to the morning yeah. and there they, there right. they are. Yep. Yep. Exactly. But you know, I think they felt like that was too soft. It was too TV movie whatever I, I i you know you kind of, at some point in the process and you know how the, these things go and it's like you're you're kind of dealing with you know committees um you throw up your hands and you're like okay you know it's your it's your money do what you want but now two good things in in the film that i liked mm. is you have two people from friday the 13th part three i sure do <laughs> that's right <laughs> ari and tracy yes well the interesting yeah. about tracy who i i knew um, having done the Friday the 13th documentaries and everything else that I've been involved with in that franchise, a whole other conversation. But uh, Tracy, I'd gotten to know um, because of that. And she also, in real life, she was the reporter on the OJ case, the local LA reporter. She yes. was she was that. Yeah, I so, lived in LA at that time. And, and uh, oh, did when, you? yeah, and, and when I moved to LA, my friend goes, remember the girl who gets the who gets killed in the in the hammock in Friday the 13th part three? I'm like, yeah. yeah. She's like, yeah, she's a reporter now. And I'm like, no. And then I saw her yeah. on TV. So yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Well, she became kind of like 
think she was with NBC at that time, like the LA, you know, KNBC for Los Angeles. And I think she was kind of like the star reporter and she had broken some little piece of the case, like, like public, like she'd reported on some element of the case that was supposed to be confidential or maybe under seal at that point while the trial was going on. And they ended up subpoenaing her. She was, she was on the witness stand in that case. Oh, wow. trying to make her divulge force and she wouldn't do it. Um, but so she was, you know, very in, intimately involved. So when I asked her to do this, she goes, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I need to make anything up here. So she as a favor. She did that. And then Larry uh, Zerner has been my entertainment attorney for 20 years now. So, oh. uh, you know, the, the dog walking witness, I was like, get over here. <clears throat> yeah, so, I, I thought that was funny because yeah, I'm friends with him on Facebook and, and he d- oh, you nice. know, communicates with people through through there. So. Yeah, he seems like a yep, really nice guy. Yep. So cool, and just did one of the, the the lights of my life. One of my true friends, and uh, <laughs> I'm just so blessed to have you know these people that I kind of like, you know, like you, like, and then all of us are you know, generation. I don't even know how old you are, but like, yeah, you grew up loving these films. And you know who Shelley is. <laughs> oh, are you okay? So we're close to the same age, and um, but yeah, so so Larry was just you know just again a, a bright spot in my life, and just the, he's always been so supportive of everything I've ever done. And he's like, "I'll do it." You know? <laughs> Walk with the dog, and that's his dog actually. That's his dog, <laughs> really his dog. So he's so, like, "Yeah, she was so good. She deserves an award." <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, anyway, listen, it was a fun project to make. We had a great cast, um, shot cheaply, shot quickly. Uh, I knew we were in for some a, a rough ride with the, the with the with the kind of knee jerk reaction to the whole thing, but to be expected, I guess, after the f- previous one. Um, and at that point, I was like, "Well, what do we have to lose? What are what are, what are a few more death threats?" Right. <laughs> Just another Monday. <laughs> sure. Why not? Well, I would like to have you stay on for two more films, and then if you would like to leave, you can. If you'd like to stay for a little bit longer. I do have movies that you worked on, like produced, direct, you know, other stuff like documentaries okay. and things. Yeah, so we it's can, up we to can you. talk a little bit longer. I got, I got about maybe twenty five more minutes I can do. Oh, perfect. Okay, so we'll go with so the the other true crimes, of course, are your two most recent ones, which would be like yep. the. I guess that these would be, well, they're not a trilogy, but I guess that they would go together. No. So you know, the American okay, Boogeyman. Be, I keep telling them we. We want to really offend people even more, you know, because like I now I'm on this kick where I'm like, well, I I heard that I might have offended some people. Next time I'm going to offend everyone. <laughs> so that's my new mark. Anyway, uh, but no, no, but I, I I keep saying my 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 joke among the 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 you know the film community is, oh, you know, like you said, trilogy. So we we had American Boogie Man, American Boogie Woman, and I think now we need American Boogie Child or Baby. Oh, there you go. There's probably some evil kid you know? out there. Because I think that would make that would offend people, and I'm hoping that that's the case. Well, now my my question with both of these, because the first one is Ted Bundy, American Boogeyman, and then the second one right. is Elaine, and I always mispronounce her name. How do you pronounce it? It's actually Eileen Warnos. It's, it's Warnos. It's just like the name Eileen, but it's with an A, so it's Eileen Warnos. Okay, which, Warnos, who obviously was was, was Warnos, Warnos. Okay, thank you. And then that's and she's no, American um, Boogie Woman, and um, woman. <laughs> right. So and by the way, not my girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the one I would actually like to talk about first because I was confused while watching it, and and I'm like, okay. wait a minute, this is a film noir film, you know, like yep. like film fantal movie. This isn't yep. Like her just going out and killing those like 18 men. This is something nope. totally different. This is like poison ivy and some of these other things. So mm-hmm. why mm-hmm. did you go in that direction instead of just her just killing people? Well, number one, there was a, a little movie that could called Monster about 20 years ago now where, that Charlize Theron played that role and won the Oscar. Oh, yeah. I'm like, we'll never top that. We already, they told that story as well as I think it could ever be told on film. It's been done. So again, this was, Boogie Woman was one, and I hate seeing the title. When it crosses my lips, <laughs> I cringe. Um, 
But Eileen Warnos, when that came to me on the heels of the Ted Bundy movie, both of those projects were kind of pitched to me. They neither were my idea. They were kind of like, well, can you do this for us? Um, but the first one, Ted Bundy, was a little more interesting to me. When they got to Eileen Warnos, I said, well, that was my, my reaction was you got Monster and you got Charlize and you can't, uh, you can't one up that in any way, shape or form. But I went again and do my research <laughs> and I found out this chapter of Eileen Warner's life that was bizarre to say the least that when she was like 20 or 21 years old, after she had left her miserable life, terrible, abusive, horrible life, she had lived childhood. She had lived in Michigan and she'd made her way down to Florida. She met this millionaire, this old man in Lewis fell multimillionaire, you know, living in, you know, this kind of bedroom community, you know, amongst, you know, people who sailed boats and, and belong to the yacht club and golf club and, you know, all of this, you know, like living the, living the dream. And she meets this elderly man and within weeks they get married and nothing has ever been written or talked about other than the fact she married this elderly man. And apparently it was a disaster from day one. And she had, been arrested for barroom brawling during this very short-lived marriage, which I think lasted less than two months, um, and that she had allegedly beat Mr. Fell with his own cane. That's all that's ever been written about that story. And immediately when I talked about that to the producers, they're like, make that movie. <laughs> like, what? Just not, that's not a movie. They're like, just make it. Just make it. Just make something out of that. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you people. And the, and <laughs> and what I came to was another little thing that she loved the femme fatales of, you know, the, the Barbara Stanwyck's and Lana Turner's and, you know, the, 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 the strong women of silent, well, no, sorry, silent films, but the golden age of films. Um, and I thought, what if she saw herself like that? And what if, and then there was an interesting documentary that was made about her during her final days and when she was on death row. It was horrible, it was really tragic to watch because you can just see how fractured her mind was and how she was not even sort of capable of sort of seeing reality. And some people say, oh, it was a big act so she could get out of her death sentence, but who knows? All I know is that it was tragic and she was a horribly abused woman who sadly murdered a bunch of men. I think it was seven or eight men. and. She ended up, you know, as they do in Florida, ex was being executed. And so I thought to myself, well, if she is kind of not there and she's facing that those last few hours of her life and this, you know, journalist comes and wants to talk to her about her life story. And she's like, you know what? People are making money on me and they're making movies and books and shit. And I'm going to be dead. The idea was she's going to fuck with this guy for a few hours. And tell him this part of her life, but tell it in a way that she would make it sound juicy. Mm, and that's okay. really where the movie was born. That's, that's what the movie's about. It's like, there's truth in all of it. Like the brother that had cancer of his throat and all of these little pieces of her life that are accurate. But none of what she's telling, it's a little bit like um, the usual suspects where he's just like fucking with him the whole time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> she's so but sad them. <laughs> If she so says them. I should have said that like that. It could have been much more concise. Um, <laughs> she, she so says. She so says the, um, the 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 reporter, and yet you know it still was an interesting chapter of her life that few people know about. And like you said, with the Nicole thing, you could go onto Google and search that, and you would see she did marry him. And I think that's interesting. I don't know if it's interesting enough to warrant an entire feature film, but. <laughs> <laughs> But that was <laughs> that was the uh, that was the premise. That was the beginning of it, and that's how it all. And the other thing is, it's important to mention talking about Boogeyman and Boogie Woman um, was that we made those movies at the height of the pandemic when everybody was locked down and nobody was working, and people were terrified of like having no money. And I thought, well, if these people want to make this movie, these movies, and we do it very kind of off the grid. And we're able to get it done and nobody gets sick and everybody makes a little money to, you know, pay their rent this month, then let's do it. But that was kind of like the weird other semi altruistic version of why I made the films when I did, because the money people wanted to get them done, 
these were their ideas and it would put, you know, a hundred people to work during a pandemic. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That was the other, (laughs) you know, motive I guess I had. Um, But yeah. And I got one of the things and I don't toot my, it's not to toot my horn, but, but to say, and I don't think probably Quentin Tarantino did this, but you know, when I made these films, I donated my directing fees to charities of, uh, and violent uh, people who the charities that support people who are victims of violent crimes. Oh, that's nice. That's good. So that was, you know, but people don't want to acknowledge that. They just want to say I'm a monster who makes movies that exploit poor victims. Un- unlike all the Lifetime movies and, you know, the all of that movies, stuff the that. Podcast, the, the Discovery, the Datelines, the, all of that. Now. There's never been a Ted Bundy movie before. There's never been an Eileen Mornos movie before. There's never been a, a Charles Manson movie before. Never. Before mine. Never. Who would never. have the audacity to do that? How dare you? Yeah, but you you got sent, you know, you got, you know, your finger, you know, somebody's finger was pointed at you instead of the, you know, hundred other people that did it. So you yeah. got the brunt, oh, unfortunately. It was, it was convenience. It was the internet being bored and needing to hate somebody else that day. That's really what it all boiled down to. Well, and I tend to, because I I'm a researcher. I like to look stuff up, and and so while I was watching that that one. I, I'm like, this didn't mm-hmm. happen. I'm sorry. This did not happen. Which, this is completely which fake. One? The, uh, I uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, this didn't. Okay. And so I, yeah. I looked it up. And, and I'm like, oh, crap. Right. There's all the pictures. It This did happen. Right. And then when I thought right. about it, because she's bookending it, where she looks like herself from Monster, is, and yeah. then, of course, you, you get um, the... Uh, uh, um, what's it? I'm like on a Peyton list, you know. Who I'm just like, oh, yeah. hey, she's from Cobra Kai, and she's beautiful. Right. And it's like, wait a minute, she, she doesn't. Right. She doesn't have that face. Is right. she then in her mind picturing herself beautiful? That's right. right. You know, that's exactly right. The whole thing is her movie. She's making up in her mind. That's what the movie is about. She's making up a movie in her head to tell this guy what he something that he wants her to say she's trying to prolong her execution like from for, to delay it from happening so the more she goes on with this bullshit the more time she thinks she's buying herself and you see the reporter he's like you don't have much time you know if you want to spend it like this but i know what you're saying is nonsense i mean we cut away to him several times saying that right oh and don't forget tobin bell is in it of course Oh my God, so great and such a pleasure. And I mean, honestly, out of all of those movies, I have to say the Boogie Woman cast and crew were, I think, the most, you know, just the word fun, that's so easily said, but they were just the, <laughs> the most joyful to be around. It was such a great energy on that set with those people. And again, making this so quickly for so little money and doing it, you know, just kind of weirdly on a lark, you know, and kind of keeping people employed. Um, it just was, we were all so grateful to be there, but we also just liked each other as people. We just laughed a lot and there were just, you know, she, Peyton was just, a, she was like the breath of fresh air on that set because she's so young and kind of not, um, jaded in any way. Uh, she just had a, she just always had me laughing and we had a lot in common. And as we found out and, and we would just give each other shit all the time. And <laughs> it was great. It was just a great experience. That's so did you have the same experience on Ted Bundy? American Boogeyman. Um, which was made first. That was the first of the two. Um, yes and no, but that was scarier because it was right at the beginning of the pandemic where like we literally were just stepping our toe out of our door for the first time. Like when we were on lockdown, that part, that's when that was done. So everybody was very trepidatious, very nervous, not comfortable. The work, the way that we, the people work now in the, in the, in the entertainment, they were just inventing it. In fact, we were like the weather balloon to see if it would even work. We had every union and every, you know, like SAG monitor, Screen Actors Guild monitor watching us like hawks, like these people are going to all end up with COVID and this is never going to (laughs) work. Like we were just like, like in a Petri dish just to see what was going to happen. Um, so we were kind of all scared, you know, I think maybe it worked in the movies to the movie's benefit because it's so like awful, but, um, <laughs> and scary, but yeah, I mean, the whole thing was an experiment 
to see if it could even be done. If you could make a movie during a pandemic and we proved that you could and nobody got knock on, you know, whatever <laughs> our, our lucky stars aligned and nobody got COVID at all during the making of that. There were a couple of close calls, but we, nobody tested positive. Oh, that's good. Now, the one but, thing that I do so, find yeah. funny is mm. you had Hillary Duff in one film and then you had Chad mm-hmm. Michael Murray in the Ted yeah. Bundy and both of them had worked <laughs> right. together on what was it like a Cinderella story or Cinderella story. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm like, I'm pulling all these like Disney kids and corrupting all of them. <laughs> yes. You right. I'm shaking but my that's, fist um, at you. Hilarious. Um, <laughs> please. And Hillary. Yes. Maybe that was kind of a weird pun, but, uh, but no, no, like Hillary again was, was such a professional. And so on top of that, she was a really demanding part for her. She'd never done anything like that. Um, she wasn't entirely comfortable with it, but she, you know, really went for it. And I respected her greatly. Chad was kind of the same, but even maybe a little bit more, um, but kind of serious minded about the whole thing. Like he really wanted to dig into this character. I think if we'd had more time or money resources, he would have gone, gone the whole physical transformation part of it. But we, we, I remember some of the reviews were like, and the terrible wig he has on his head. And I'm like, that's his hair. <laughs> <laughs> you people are so stupid. You can't tell the difference between, you know, a terrible movie wig and somebody's like hair that's been like curled with a curling iron, which is what they had to do with it. They had to make it all like, puffy like you know lee major's six million dollar man um but no that's chad sarah but uh <laughs> now he was really great and super on top of it and um committed to it that's that's all i can say he was, he was great he was always knew his lines he was always prepared um respectful to everybody but again we were all kind of tiptoeing because we didn't know like nobody wanted to step within you know 10 feet of each other <laughs> we were just oh yeah because yeah 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 that's what i mean but that's why it was uncomfortable we we're all just kind of like everybody's looking at each other like does he have it you know? <laughs> I'm like, how are we going to make it through the day um one little so cough yeah, was, that, you know. <laughs> we're, oh yeah it was that point where it was somebody would cough or, like inhale dust and they'd cough or sneeze and you'd be like oh my god get them to a hospital you know yeah um, <laughs> it's just there was that sense of paranoia and fear and i mean some of it was founded some of it was a little extreme um but it made the making of it really difficult on top of the fact that we were still doing it for no time and no money and you still had to make your days and you still had to get these shots and you still had to direct all these actors and it was a, it was a pressure cooker on that one well and uh, now like tobin bell on 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 the other one you now have lynn shay <laughs> oh yeah oh my god again she was on the first day of shooting and she did everything in her one day and the fact that Lynn Shay, who's a much, much older woman, obviously, was willing to come out of her, you know, her cubby hole, very safe and take a chance with us was just so amazing to me that she would even say, not only just say yes, but even consider it. She, I, I thought she was, I thought she was going to say, you people are nuts. I'm not leaving my house. Uh, <laughs> she's like, no, let's try. Which you couldn't blame you her know, if, if she did at that time. Cautious of her. Say one more time. I said, but you couldn't blame her at that time. Oh, no, no, no. But she was yeah. so the opposite. You know, she's so sweet and accommodating and just incredibly uh, generous and, and nice to everybody. Um, and I think grateful to have the opportunity. I think she, we were all feeling that kind of like, you know, that, that you know, I don't know, the locked up syndrome, I'll call it. We all had it. Um, and I think she maybe there was like the heart of her. She was so relieved, like she'd come out and play for for a day. <laughs> but uh, it was actually it was Lynn who who sent a letter to Stag saying how um, protected and respected she felt on that set, and that oh, they didn't nice. have to worry about us. We were we were going to have everybody's back. And so I think they got a little more lenient on us, not lenient, but like they weren't sending shadow agents down to the set to watch our every move after Lynn sent them that letter. So, um, but no, she was so great. And she's oh, really good, good in it. <laughs> she, she didn't, you know, she got some bad reviews for that, like a couple of them. That's the typical fake outrage people. Um, but you know, I thought she was really outstanding. That was a crazy part, and that and the mother was exactly the way Lynn played it. You know, when when they came to her after Bundy had been um, executed, and they played for her his confession tapes. I think it was rep- a couple of reporters that came to her. In fact, it was someone had written a book about him and had been going to the prison. So, you know, obviously you're telling the story in a 
more dramatic way. But yeah, so she did, she heard the tapes in the first, and her reaction was not, oh my God, it's true. My son is a, was a brutal monster. Her answer to them was, how would you like some ice cream and hot apple pie? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about denial, it's, right? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. That, but that's actually true. You know, there's a lot of things that came from in that, in that movie especially, there was a lot of moments that I felt like were really pulled from the case files, not only just some of the names and characters and things, but just some of the details of what, what actually happened. Um, and, you know, again, when you're doing it for so little money, you try to, like, like in reality, the young woman, uh, Carol Durant, she had abducted her from the mall. So we couldn't go into the mall because it was, you know, who could have, who, there's no malls that look like the 70s anymore. So, so we had the outside of the mall. Oh, yeah. But in reality, she was in a Walden Books or like browsing in a Walden Books, uh, which was a big, you know, you probably remember it was like a big chain of bookstores in all the malls back then. And so we couldn't do that. So I was like, oh, okay. And I talked to her amazing production designer, Kalise. And she's like, I'll make you a Walden Books bag. <laughs> so, <she's, laughs> so, so when she's talking and going from the mall and that mall scene, if you look closely, she's holding a Walden Books bag with the actual Walden Books logo on it. So oh, you know, you, sometimes you have to do it the deep way, but you kind of get your little nods in there. Yeah, that's that's funny. A little Easter egg there. So, yeah, you, mm-hmm. you know, you yeah. got to do what you got to do. You know, if you can't get in there, give her a you bag. That makes it, sense. Uh, you make it. It's always that thing of making it work. And I think people who don't have never made a movie, I think they don't understand just how, you know, on your toes you have to be at every moment and thinking 10 steps ahead, ahead of what you're going to need and anticipating things that, you know, you know, if you had the money, the resources to do it, you would you know, do it the Peter Jackson way <laughs> or maybe oh. your A-list director. <laughs> when you're kind of out there making indie movies, you know, you, you're in crunch time and, and, and you still got a bunch of people waiting on you to get going and you got a number, you know, whatever number of pages you have to shoot that day and you, but come hell or high water, you have to make it. So, oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That all makes sense. So, well, let yep. me, because I know that you need to leave. I'm just going to quickly tell you what I, what else I own that you've worked on and then I'll let you go. Okay. So you don't have to really so comment or anything. So nice it's a, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> I didn't realize it. So, but I'll show the audience. So later you can, if you look at this, you'll okay. see what I'm showing. So um, Halloween, uh, 25 years of terror you worked on. Okay. Yep. Got that. Also the uh, never sleep again, the Elm street legacy. Uh, one of my just most beloved projects ever yeah it's a great documentary and some of these you produced some you directed some you were special thanks mm-hmm. some so it's a little across the oh, board okay. um Maybe, never you probably know things that i don't know oh, i don't know who's, who, who's, who's ever given me special thanks but but that's that's very nice of them it was oh um uh, demon house oh zach bagan's movie yeah, yeah it says yeah. special thanks too Oh, I do remember that. Yeah, it was really kind of him because he and I had been, I had been kind of, I know Zach and he was going through a lot of stuff at that point when he was doing that. And I was kind of a, maybe a little voice of sanity in his head trying to keep things a little more level for him, I guess. I mean, maybe that was my only contribution to it, but uh, yeah, he's, he, he was having a rough spell there. I think just, just dealing with the fact that he was staying in this allegedly haunted house that, you know, was very creepy. And now he's out here in Las Vegas. So I'm I'm in Las yep. Vegas. And I have, I have not yet been to the museum. I have to go out. I have to go. I need to go to. I have to go check it out. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll go with you. Oh, yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, and Is then it? we got, because um, I believe you directed, didn't you, Never Sleep Again? I co-directed that with Andrew Cash, who is a good friend of mine and has gone on to become such a successful director and editor in his own right. He's, been directing episodes of uh, uh, Legends of Tomorrow, and, and he edited on the Flash series, and oh, wow. he's been very successful. Of and now he's doing another show, I think for DC. I can't remember which one it is, but he's on he's another another big show right now. So, um, but I'll actually believe it or not, those the, those opportunities for him all came out of Never Sleep Again. Oh, perfect. Well, it's a great documentary. So, yeah. Well, thank you. And they talk yeah. about making something for five cents. That was made for less than five cents. I mean, it was literally. <laughs> A group of us geeks, fan boys, whatever you want to call us, and filmmakers who wanted to tell the story of Nightmare on Elm Street. It was around the time of the remake. And we're like, well, that's not going to be good. Let's no. just tell the story of the original series. And that's what we, we just went and did it. 
and we we're like, be, just devil be damned, you know, we'll just go do it. And that's what we did. We just, we, we called in every favor that you can imagine from every friend and every associate of anyone we knew. And that's how that show came together because we had zero budget. Oh, wow. Because then you also worked yeah. on uh, Crystal Lake Memories, the complete history of Friday the 13th. That was uh, written absolutely. in Absolutely. Also, yes. And that was another passion play of mine, <laughs> uh, passion project of mine that, that uh, I had collaborated with Peter Brackey on his amazing book, Crystal Lake Memories, which had come out in 2005 or six. Um, and it was a huge success. And I was the editor of the book and we published it ourselves again, thinking nobody's going to care about this book. Like, <laughs> we probably won't be able to sell a thousand copies, much less 5,000, oh, right. which we ended up doing. And then years after the fact and kind of a long circuitous story, <laughs> but uh, I'd made one other documentary on Friday the 13th, which I was really, I was kind of unhappy with in the way that I'm happy with the Nicole Brown movie where I kind of wanted to distance myself from it called His Name Was Jason. Um, it was all, we had all the right pieces, but it was all put together very hastily and sloppily in my opinion. Um, so I really wanted to do it right. And so we took some of the pieces from that and then created a whole bunch of new pieces and created this opus epic seven hour thing called Crystal Lake Memories based on Pete's book. And I'm awfully glad I did because people seem to really like that one. Oh, it's great. And I don't remember how I got this, but I even got a, a bonus disc. So nice. Bought, so you probably, maybe, I feel like they did a pre-order on that. Like if you pre-ordered it, you would get this extra disc with all the kind of uncut or whatever, like pieces of interviews that didn't make the show. But that I'm like, if you didn't it. get enough with seven hours, how about 12 hours? Yeah. Hey, here's more. <laughs> well, because then the right? next one that I have is his name is Jason. So I, I have that also. Oh, okay. Or, or, or. <laughs> Although, you know what I have to say about that show? We had Tom Zavini, you know, hosting that. That was super cool. And he was so nice. Yeah. And we got to shoot it in the Universal um, Horror Nights Friday the 13th maze that they had, had running that year. And they were kind enough to let us literally shoot there for, I, didn't, I mean, probably for free. I don't, I don't know what we ended up paying for the thing. But the fact we had Tom Savini for one night and got to shoot all those little wraparound pieces with him was fun. That being said, the project itself was a bit of a nightmare for me. <laughs> So don't watch watch Crystal Lake Memories then. Stick stick with that one. Watch Crystal Lake Memories. You can yeah, that one's okay if you want kind of the I don't know, VH1, you know, kind of version of 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 Friday the 13th, but but Crystal Lake Memories really goes in depth. It's incredibly long. Um I think it's better produced, uh looks better, sounds better, you know. I mean, we had Corey Feldman narrating which <laughs> <laughs> and kind of weirdly hosting. He does kind of a little wrap around, which people, I didn't know what they would think, but I'm like, he's Tom, Tommy Jarvis. I think people are going to like it, you know, and they did. Yeah. They ended up like, and I actually, Corey did, Corey did a nice job as a narrator. I was very impressed. Yeah. I thought he did a good job. So yeah, both hosts did a good mm -hmm. job. So yeah. 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 Um, so and then those the, reasons, both are. Yeah. So definitely check out the Elm Street and the Friday the 13th ones. So because those are really good documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and yeah, then, that, the Never Sleep was just such like in a way like our baby, you know, like it really was the one because we did it out of pure love and nothing else, and we ended up winning the Saturn Award that year. <laughs> oh, that. sweet! <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, the little the little show that could, you know, we were so proud of it. Nice. Um, then the next one I have is Going to Pieces: The Rise and Fall of the Slasher uh -huh. Film. I, I don't remember being in that or being interviewed for it, but I feel like I provided some materials for it, something like that. I, but I remember the show and I remember it being well made. Yeah, I think Rachel Bolofsky, who did, um, uh, who does, who she heads up the Scream Fest film festival every year. Um, she, I think she was one of the producers of that, if I recall. Uh, she is. Yeah, I'm looking at the back. So, nice. but it's good. Yeah, it's good. The only thing that really surprised me yeah, about this one is the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre is not mentioned. Not once. Really? Oh, yeah. I thought that weird. was weird. That's yeah. A weird oversight. Oh. I haven't yeah. seen that. Since I, I think I, they had like a, like a screening, maybe a Scream Fest one night, you know, kind of like release party for it. Like when we saw it on the big screen, I saw it that one time and then I, I haven't seen it since. So I guess I didn't make that connection. But that is weird. That, that seems strange they wouldn't mention Chainsaw yeah. of all things. Yeah. I've watched it a couple times. Um, and then just the last hmm. couple got uh, Scream yeah. the Inside Story. I didn't know I had this. 
the thing to do. I mean, this, I'm, I'm sorry, my mind's blown. I'm like, what? I guess I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> yeah, you have. I got a lot of stuff here. So, and I bought that Scream so five five film disc set, and it's a Scream yeah. Inside Story. Yep, yep, exactly. And that came on the heels of Never Sleep Again. We ended up selling that, like as the TV version of that, to A and E. I think it was, and um, they came to us and said, "Hey, we'd like to do something else with you guys. You're, we really like your that Never Sleep Again documentary. What what else could you do?" And that, that was the point. Scream Four was in production so we're like could we do something on scream and they're like you can but it can only be about the first movie i'm like well that doesn't make any sense they're like no no we have a show called um the inside story and it really like it doesn't deal with sequels it only deals with like the impact of like a culturally culturally relevant film like they did jaws i think they did halloween i think they did you know name it they probably did on that series and so we kind of like begrudgingly agreed to only make it about the original screen, but we kind of threw in a few mentions about the sequels at the end of the show. And then obviously kind of winking the fact that screen four was coming up. So yeah, that was really cool to do. And oh, we actually nice. had a budget. It's a good so one. <laughs> so, so we're like, wow, we can afford, you know, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> and then anyway, I have three, which I'll put all together here because they're all part of the same series. It looks like you did all the, or at least almost all of the behind the scenes stuff mm -hmm. for the Friday the Thirteenth series that came out with like like the three D covers. Yep. And yep. I, so yep. I have here exactly right. Yeah, uh, the final chapter, and then mm -hmm. uh, a new beginning. And yep. I didn't pull them all. I just pulled three, and then the new blog. Yeah, I think I got all the way to eight. I did four through eight, and and the quick backstory there was that I had just come off of his name was Jason, not had a great experience, but a good friend of mine, um, who was a post production um, producer on another series, um, kind of knew the who actually, by the way, I knew him because he used to work for Sean Cunningham. Um, you know, director of original Friday the 13th. And that's how I knew this guy, Jeff, Jeff Garrett, who was also one of our partners on the Crystal Lake Memories uh, book. And so I knew Jeff well, and he kind of saw the pain in my eyes and <laughs> after, <laughs> after his name was Jason had happened. And it just so happened, this little production company up the hall from where he worked, he got wind of the fact that they were producing the Friday the 13th special edition releases for Paramount. And he just mentioned, you know, my friend Dan like knows everything there is to know about, Par uh, about Friday the 13th. And they're like, oh my God, can we talk to him? We just did parts one through three that were, didn't go very well because we don't know anything about these movies. Would he talk to us? And he goes, yeah, I think sure he would. And then I, that's when they called me. That's how that all started. It was nice. literally just kind of being, knowing somebody who worked up the hall. <laughs> oh, but that was a lot of fun that really was like and again we didn't have much of a budget to play with but but we just went out and we shot this like silly mockumentary on like as if the crystal like mur murders had happened in real in real life and we'd gotten a bunch of people to be in it like even Stuart gordon played larry zerner's dad you know the bereaved father of shelly in one of the pieces and you know <laughs> we just we just had a, a bunch of fun with it and then you know and just we got to go through all the archives that paramount had of all of the outtakes from the films, especially part four, the final chapter, and found almost every frame that they had excised from the finished movie. So that was really fun. Um, wow. and that's, we also unfortunately learned that Paramount had actually, somebody at Paramount, I won't say the people that we were working for, but somebody along the 20 year hiatus between, you know, when we did that and when part seven had come out, which was kind of the infamous one, it had gotten cut quite a bit. You know, oh, there was yeah. so much more graphic gore to part seven and uh sadly it was you know mpaa or whatever had forced them to cut the shit out of that movie and yeah. we went looking for it and we found one box that said please junk these outtakes from part seven mm. and everything had been thrown in the trash oh years ago like years like we're talking about like the early 90s maybe mid 90s well, I, I remember that I went to a convention. I think it was a Fangoria convention a long time ago, mm -hmm. decades ago. And Adam Marcus was there sure. and, and he was uh, right. promoting Jason Goes to Hell. And he was there with Kane Hodder. Mm -hmm. And he showed right. a bunch of scenes from Jason Goes to Hell. And then he showed a lot of the cut stuff. Um, I guess what was available oh, wow. from the other cool. movies. The funny thing is, right. cut to years later, 
I'm in college, I go to Sundance, I see Adam Marcus's film um, at the time was called Snow Days. I talk to him. Oh, yeah, I remember that. He then becomes mm -hmm. my mentor in college. Oh, wow. <laughs> and and so I used to hang out with him at Jeez. his house and everything. And and then, yeah. you know, and so that was, it's interesting how that all kind of worked out with Friday the 13th. But um, yeah, so, he, he so, showed a lot of that stuff, the, those scenes that were unfortunately cut. Yeah, I feel like that movie they were able to later, I know he's been working on his own documentary on the kind of whole weird history behind that one. Yeah. Um, he's been working on that for a couple of few years. I think like in the, they started before the pandemic and then they had to shut it down and it was like a whole thing. But um, but yeah, that'll be interesting to see when that comes out. But yeah, no, Adam's super cool. And I think again, you know, he got a lot of, you know, the backlash at the time for his take dare take to take a different approach to Jason. And, you know, I mean, I didn't love the film. I think it has its, you know, nostalgic lovers now, the people who have kind of come around on it. Um, but again, you know, it was his vision of it. He had the right to do that and he didn't deserve to be hated for it. Um, but it's tough, you know, being, you know what it's like. It's just, you know, people think because your name's on a screen or they see your face in a movie, like they, you basically have no feelings. Um, right. And that what they say doesn't hurt you in some way. Of course it does. We were all the kids that were, you know, we grew up, you know, I mean, every artist is wounded in some way. You just are, you know, you're either, you know, not popular in school or you got rejected a bunch of times in your life. And, and then you kind of come around and you want to just, you know, take that place that you used to escape to movies or comic books or whatever, and you kind of make it your own. And then you find like, oh, I'm still not liked, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's tough. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, all right, well, I know that you have to go. Um, is there anything that you would like to promote? It could be past, present, future. Anything you'd like to like to let anybody know oh, about? Oh, God. So kind. And thanks for taking so much time and, and just indulging me oh, here. Oh, no, all this these is awesome. Different projects. I had no idea that my life had become a retrospective at this point. <laughs> um, all this many more lows than highs, I guess. But that being said, yeah, no, I've got a few things in the cooker right now. Another, it's another, I've got another Amityville project, which I'm super excited about. Ooh. that We're probably going to announce soon. Um, it's not a, you know, what we'll call it, the, uh, the dumpster dive of Amityville <laughs> kind of movies that, you know, you see that are made on iPhones or whatever. There'll be a real <laughs> budget behind it and some really cool people. I can't make any announcements about who potentially might be in it, but let's just say it'll take us right back to the beginning. Um, and so that's in the works. And then I've got a television project that I've been kind of quietly shopping around. Um, it has a lot to do with horror films that I, you and I and our ilk of, you know, our little weird film family grew up loving and has definitely some, some close ties to some of those, you know, famous titles. And then, gosh, what else? Oh, and then I, I wrote a horror script during the pandemic that's making its rounds around the town and getting some good feedback, but it's kind of like a horror comedy. So I'm kind of going to go back to my slasher roots with it. And it's not a true crime. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> so, um, maybe, maybe I'll be hated for another making a slasher movie, but for different reasons. Um, but that being said, yeah, so it's been a fun kind of productive, creative time. And I'm just, again, I, I wake up every day. I'm just so grateful for everything and the highs and the lows and the good and the bad. It just, it's all so amazing to me. Like that you can be that kid one day and then one day you're, you get to do this stuff for a living. It's, it's, right. it's, it's a bit of a dream. So, and I, you know, I wish the same for every would be filmmaker, you know, and just kind of keep at it and, you know, kind of turn off the noise. And that's what all of that stuff on the internet is just noise. Just try to tune it out and, and just focus on what you can do and do the best you can with the resources you have. That's what I always tell young filmmakers. Just go out and make whatever you can for whatever money you have. Even if it's like we had five cents for, <laughs> for one of ours, it felt like five cents. But, you know, just tell your stories and don't let people get you down because that's sometimes their aim and their goal. So don't let them let them do it. Oh, there's professional people who just do that. That's that's what they do. They for sure. have 20 yeah. accounts and just hate people, you know. Yep. Yeah, and it's sad, but it's like, you know, at least at the end of the day, I can say that's not my life. You know, I didn't wake up this morning and write nasty things to people who I don't know. No, so, and, and, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll say, but, yeah, I'll say this and then I'll let you go is, is I used to on Facebook, yeah, like no, somebody would go, I saw this movie. And if I didn't like it, I'd be like, mm -hmm. how could you like this film? This film was right. awful. Well, and, and, and then I went, all, and it's fine. 
But it's like, I don't want people to say they love my movies. I just don't want personal attacks against people like myself or or the people who were in them. It's just but, fucking wrong. But what does that um, achieve, you know, though? Even if you, you know, right. it, it's like me telling you that the film yeah. you like is awful. What does that right. do for anything? It does, and so I'm like, no, wait, this is dumb. Why? Why do I? But isn't art? I mean, art is to be debated. Art's to be discussed and and thought over and mold about. I mean, that's that's the name of the game. I mean, there've been critics since the time of you know the dawn of man. That being said, but I think we've just gone so far into that extremist kind of stuff that that's the part that disturbs me you know they're like there's they take all of the fun out of it even the marvel movies and they're like these people have like they're waging war like a jihad against the filmmakers <laughs> if they don't like something just nuts no well, that's true and i and, and i have to admit that i've i've been you know i'm i'm, I'm guilty of some of that so you know with sometimes not even well, really notice, you know, you know realizing it if anything just maybe it's time to just spread more awareness. Like if you don't like something, that's great, but stop at the cheap shots. And, you know, it's like, this isn't life or death. You know, I, I, I probably would have more issue if, you know, what we were doing was like the, the cure to cancer was on the line, but it's not right. You know, there'll be another movie. There'll be another Marvel superhero movie. There'll be another Halloween, believe it or not, there will be more Halloween yeah. movies. You know, if you didn't like the last one, it's, it's, you know, it's just but more it, fun to be had all the time. And and I, I just would say to so many of these people, like, go out and make your own film before you oh, start yeah. passing such harsh judgment. See how easy it is. Which it is so not. That, and and, and, no, and, no. and that's where you need to be <laughs> constructive. Like, I can understand if somebody right. doesn't like something. But you can't, no. I just don't like, this sucks. Okay, why does well, it yeah, suck? Yeah, yeah. Listen, I, I have my own opinions too, and I've, I'm probably among my group of friends, probably one of the more opinionated <laughs> of the gang. <laughs> but that being said, you know, I always do try to like, I don't make it personal. You know, you don't turn it into a, like a war against the people behind it. And actually, what's interesting for me is kind of like looking at stuff now, like, oh my God, can you imagine what they went through on this day? The fact that this this had to have been impossible to to achieve. Um, I didn't think of like the people behind cats, you know, it was so, <laughs> like, I don't think anybody <laughs> went making, trying to make cats into a bad movie. Nobody goes in with that intention, um, but, or buttholes in there. It doesn't, it doesn't happen, you know? And I think it's just, it's, it's, that's what art is. It's experimental. You fail more times than you succeed. That's just the way it goes. Yeah. Not, not everything that Stephen King writes is perfect and he's even admitted to it. So, right. You know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And he's, you know, but, but does it stop him? No, he just no. does something else. And he just, it's just tuning out the noise. I think that's just a, an important lesson I've learned over the past several years. And especially when there was no noise, you know, <laughs> it's so quiet when we were all locked down It just gave us all the time to, what I'd hoped was people would come back from all of that feeling maybe a little more centered and, some people did, but I think so many people came out of it just full of such venom, you know, on the political spectrum and on the health spectrum and I mean, just you name it. And it just everybody's there's just this great divide and, it, and it's sad. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. So, so anyhow, my friend, well, great to chat with you and thank you for indulging great me. Great to for chat with long. you. I don't know if it's ever going to make it to this point, but thank you. And thanks. To oh, no, no, I. I let it go on as long as we want to talk. So that that's fine with me. Um, so I, I appreciate you hanging out for so long. Oh, totally. That's great. It's a pleasure. And we'll stay in touch. And um, oh, yeah. if there's anything you need, let me Oh, I will. Thank you. And, and, and if I can help in any way, please let me know. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot. And uh, happy new year to you. Thank you. You too. And I will talk to everybody who's watching later. So bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>